This is Latter-day Presentations, where we discuss topics and issues of faith for Latter-day Saints. Welcome, Dan. This is, this is, I'm excited. I think that this will be interesting. So I gave a presentation. I was actually asked to give a presentation um, by uh, the dialogue committee. So that's not, you know, that's, that's a few folks just at BYU-Idaho. They're, they're professors, they're colleagues of mine. And they said, you know, this is a discussion that we want to have. We want to figure out how we can make sure that we're helping people to feel included and like they belong. Um, and you've done a little bit of work on that. And so they wanted to, um, to have me do some discussion. Now, that being said, a couple of things. First, um, this was not pre-screened by, you know, by the university. Nobody, nobody gave me approval. Nobody looked over my slides. Um, this is these are just my opinions, so um, it's okay if people disagree with me. That's fine. Um, they should pin it on me. They should uh, hate on me, not on the university. I guess is what I'm saying. Um, and at the same time, I think you know, if anything, what the feedback that I got was that it was um, useful, but only a start. And I'm I'm completely fine agreeing with that. I think that you know, in in a, uh, an opening of a discussion, that's about the most that you can hope for. Um, <clears throat> I also want to say that this is going to be different from the presentation I gave this. I have more time. I'm here with a friend. I'm going to say things that I didn't then and, and discuss things in a little bit of a different way. And I think that that's okay too. Um, Dan, if you have questions while we're going through, then feel free to interrupt or ask, ask right away. Just, just, uh, interrupt and that that's totally fine. Okay. Um, but I'm going to start out with, uh, with, uh, a picture, <laughs> I love memes. Uh, that's that's kind of my thing. Uh, memes and Rick rolling, uh, actually. Um, and this one in particular makes me happy because it's it's like ha ha funny, um, but it's laugh out loud funny if you have a ten year old, yeah, um, or a seven year old. <laughs> like this is this is a very deeply funny meme. Um, yep. And so and I'll I'll show you some examples of this. So this is my boy. We made a mistake. Uh, we got him really excited to go um and uh go to school we, we practice with him we said all right now smile really big show us your smile and we got him in his shirt that he was excited for and this is what we got back and this is what happens during COVID. and right. you know we just we, we forgot to mention that little thing of you need to take your mask off and before that we had told him like hey you gotta take your mask off or we, we had told him you gotta keep your mask on like it's really important and he's just a good kid and he did the right thing and he kept his mask on so a few months later, uh, we're excited for round two. We got another picture day chance. And so we practiced with him and we said, hey, you got you to gotta smile real big. You got to look at the camera. You got to do, I mean, it's really important. And we, we went through and take your mask off. And we, we corrected that part. Um, well, we may have overdone it. I'll let you decide. Uh, <laughs> he is really, really happy in this picture, like over smiling by, uh, by a thousand miles an hour. So um, I have some other kids. So the <laughs> synchronized sleeping, uh, I think these two are adorable. Um, at the time they were two and four and now they're three and five. Um, I love this picture because it just says so much about my family, uh, especially this one. Um, I asked him later, I said, why, why are you, uh, why were you so upset? I, like, I try to be a little bit emotionally in touch. Like what was wrong? And he looked at me and goes, daddy, I wasn't upset. I just thought it would be a funny face to make. Um, so I thought that was kind of fun. Um, Very good. Let me wrap up with this picture. So this is the other side of the of the picture day issue. Um, and that is that sometimes they can turn out looking really good. And I love this picture because it's my boy and he looks sharp. And I just, I don't know, there's there's something about that. Well, the reason why I, I started with this um, is the other day, my son, um, this one right here, um, came to me and asked me a question. Um, and I, I hurriedly went to my wife and I said, honey, honey, um, it's time for the talk. And, uh, he asked me a question. We have a rule in my family. And the rule is that if they're old enough to ask, then we're, then they're old enough to get a real answer that we're not going to hide stuff from them. And I think that that's a good rule. Um, and she wisely, uh, corrected me and said, I think what you mean is it's the time for the first of many talks. Um, so when I talked about this at BYU-Idaho, the, the thing that I said that I, I still feel quite a lot is you can't solve every problem in one fell swoop. You can start conversations in meaningful ways. And part of the reason why we don't talk about this is because it's sensitive and it's tricky and it's hard. Um, part of it is because we're afraid. And I think none of those are actually, uh, part of it is because we can't get to all of it in one single session. 
to which my response is, okay, but talking about it in chunks is still worth doing. Um, and I think that that's really, really important. And so what I'm going to say for today is we're going to make a, a positive difference, even if all we do is start the talk, start having the conversation, open it up. Um, that requires some grace. That requires that if I get something wrong, that you know you try and understand what I'm getting at, that you don't nitpick. Um, I don't really care what Twitter thinks, but I care what my friends think. And the good news is about being around friends is that it's pretty easy because friends are special. And let me explain what I mean about that. Um, oh, actually, let me let me talk about race really quick. So <clears throat> I've listened to a few different podcasts on how to talk about race with your kids. And the consensus is really interesting. The consensus is that we wait to talk about race with our kids um, until they're old enough. Uh, until they're old enough to understand and until they're old enough to to catch the nuance. And, you know, um, I was talking to somebody and I said, well, when are you going to talk about race with your kids? And they said, well, you know, not yet. They're not quite old enough. I'm thinking maybe when they're, you know, like 17. Um, and I, I kind of kid about that. But like the problem is that you put off the hard conversation until you feel like they will be ready and they and they never are. And honestly, the other thing that's that's been found pretty clearly is that kids are noticing race at the age of three and four. They're noticing difference. They're, they're noticing how you talk about things. They're also noticing the things you're uncomfortable talking about. And so I think it's actually really good to get into this mode where we talk about things um, earlier and even when it's still scary. And that goes with our kids. That goes with, with anything. There's a quote that I heard yesterday that I quite like. And it's um, a friend of mine had a professor who said this, you'd have to be a fool to talk about it, but you're a coward if you don't. And so I, this, uh, this is interesting because I, uh, I I often hear from families of you know friends of mine that they grew up in in a home where like you you just don't talk about hard things you avoid you sweep things under the rug and what often happens is once kids grow up and reach adulthood uh, they've become a volcano. And the volcano explodes <laughs> and, you know, there's just this massive burning of everything good around the volcano ah. um, because they didn't develop some muscles early on, you know, of how to work through hard things, how to grieve a little bit, you know, at, at the unfairness of the world and, and how to grieve our own mistakes, right, in a healthy way. Um, and so it, in a lot of families where they avoid, avoid, avoid hard discussions, again, you know, s some of these kids are, are just volcanoes. They're just mm -hmm. pressurized and boom, you're going to have an explosion in adulthood. I, th I think that's a, let, let me, let me just mention civility is my thing, right? It's, it's the thing that I rant about all the time. One of the things that frustrates me the most is when people think that civility is niceness, right? Civility is the means by which we get to the core of the issue. It's the set of ground rules that lets us talk about hard things well. And I don't always succeed, right? Like it's not, it's not easy, um, but it's worth it. And I think that's exactly right. Now on that, on that comment, um, I think a lot of people will, will, will say, um, you know, don't, don't avoid hard topics. We need to be talking about them all the time. And what I'm arguing is, I think that there's actually a balance in the middle. I think it's really good that your kids know that like, you know, topics like sex or, or, or societal injustice or race, like there's a reason why people are sensitive about them. And it's because they want to get them right. And that's okay, right? It doesn't need to swing the pendulum way over to like, talk about it all the time, talk about it indiscriminately. But I think there's a way to do it sensitively and thoughtfully and also tell your kids, I'm going to try really hard to give an A minus. I'm going to try really hard to give you as much good information as I can. And also to have you understand that I'm probably going to get something wrong and that's okay too. Um, and I, because I think, and I think it's especially important the younger the kids are because they, they really treat you like the authority in your life, um, in their life, excuse me. Um, and I'm going to say the same thing here. The reason why I actually put up my credentials at the beginning um, is not because I think I have the credentials to be talking about this, but there's an idea out there that I strongly disagree with which is, well, you can't talk about this unless you are LGBTQ. You can't talk about race unless you are black. Um, <clears throat> and I'm gonna say two things about that. The first one is, um, I actually think that it's white people that need to talk about racism a lot more because it's not a problem that black people are perpetuating, right? Like if we're talking about solving the problem, um, I really do think that, that that is something that like, 
that I need to talk about more. But the second thing that I would say is I think it's a weaponized idea, right? I, I think that we don't use it fairly across the board. We, we don't, I have seen people say, well, you don't, you should not be talking about this. You don't have the credentials, <clears throat> but then somebody who looks like me and is from the same background who happens to take their side of the issue is totally fine, right? It's a way that we rejigger the conversation as framing to be like, well, you don't even know what you're talking about. Well, neither does white boy over here, right? The other guy that looks just like me, but the difference is that he agrees with you. So he's fine. Right. And I think that it just destroys, you know, the, 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 the integrity of the conversation. So that, and that's actually where I want to lead next. Um, don't trade the imperfect today for the perfect tomorrow that never comes. Whether it's with your kids or hard conversations, try your best to have them well. The people who, you know, grab one word that you say wrong and plaster you with it, they're not really trying to be serious about it anyway, right? Do the best you can with what you have, um, but move forward even if it takes a little bit of courage. Now, there's this great, um, there's this great, quote that I love that I'm going to, I'm going to share with you in a minute. Let me, let me first mention the, um, I was really nervous about this presentation that I gave at BYUI and, um, happened to talk with a good friend and he, he gave a, a bit of advice that I quite liked. He said, just remember that you're among friends. And, uh, I, I've started applying that on Twitter and on, in my personal interactions. And I just assume that I am among friends. And honestly, I'm shocked at how often people treat me like I am. And so when somebody has a concern, I pretend it's totally legitimate and that they're not just out to get me. And when somebody wants to grab a word that I say, I go, you know what, that, that probably wasn't the best word. Maybe, maybe I should do that differently. And it, it's, it's fixed my heart, but it's also allowed me to take feedback much more naturally. And I'm not scared of it anymore. And honestly, I think people respect that. And so is it perfect? No, there's still trolls and it's fine. But like, as a general rule, I think that's been really helpful. Um, the, the, my favorite quote on this is actually one that Elder Maxwell taught me. Um, there, it's been quoted by like six different people. I don't know who the original author is. I have, my Google skills are not, are not great enough. But the one that I found most consistently is Dinah Marie Craig. A friend is one to whom one may pour out the contents of one's heart, chaff and grain together, knowing that gentle hands will take and sift it. Keep what is worth keeping and with a breath of kindness, blow the rest away. Um, I'm going to say something stupid at some point. I hope it's not today because I've thought about this stuff for a while. But if it is, I hope that you'll blow it away and not worry about it. I hope that the goal, if you're going into a conversation looking for chaff, you'll find it. If you're going into a conversation looking for the grains, you will also find it. Um, I think I'm going to dispense with more preamble because we've already talked a lot and this is starting to feel like CYA instead of like framing it right. Um but I also think that it's critical. And this is the civility piece that I think is really, really important. So, um, oh, it, 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 a friend of mine, the last thing I'll say, um, I'm not credentialed enough to talk about this. I'm not credentialed enough to talk about race and racism. And I've talked about that before. I'm not like, there are too many important things that we need to talk about that I don't have the credentials for. So here's the only credential that I really have that is valuable. I care about the topic and I'm really trying. Um, and I think that those are the two that matter. A friend of mine actually gave me that advice and it was really meaningful. Okay, um, I wanna talk about belonging and what it is and what it feels like. I think that the best way to think about this um, is that belonging is not um, a condition. It's partially a feeling. Um, it's also related to our communities. Um, let, me, let me just read these bullet points. Belonging is a part of our eternal nature and destiny. It defines Zion and it defines heaven. What I mean by that is very simple. Um, belonging is the, the thriving aspect of our social nature, right? Um, thriving is what it feels like to be in a community, um, the, the, the right community, the community that loves you. Um, one of my points is that the people who belong are not as, are, are, are far more than we think. And the third is that the way that, that belonging happens is not the way that the world teaches. And I think that that's actually really important. So, um, there's this great video, which I will show you really quick. We're only going to watch about a minute of it. It's Elder Patrick Kieran, whom I adore. I, I think he's one of my favorite um, speakers. And he talks about the moment that he felt he belonged. So we're going to watch that just real quick. And I, had an experience. and I had an experience, I suppose it's about 15 years ago. I came from our home in England to General Conference. And I was coming out of a session surrounded by people from all over the world. And I thought, this is it. This is the church. We're from everywhere. We include everybody. 
and this is where I belong. And it was a wonderful feeling. Elder Kieran is awesome. And he's describing a time when he felt he belonged. Um, I'm going to tell you that it's a very similar thing for me. The place where I feel, you know, I, I've been treated so well at all the schools I've worked at. And I've also felt a little weird. Um, like I was out of place and that's because I'm a weirdo. Um, and I'm, I'm a very devout, uh, Christian. I am quite religious and everybody's been really kind. And at the same time, I stick out a little bit and I, I recognize that. And I'm also a weird, you know, Star Trek loving economist type. Um, one of the things that I felt immediately upon coming to BYU Idaho is that it's a place where I feel like I belong and that's special to me. So here Elder Kieran is at General Conference and he sees people from every walk of life, from hundreds of countries, from different nationalities, and he feels like this is belonging. And I want to emphasize that because I, I understand that too. And I, I don't just mean that in a generic, oh, you know, I'm, I'm not saying race doesn't matter. I'm not, none of that. What I'm saying is that this is an experience of belonging. And one of the things that I feel really strongly about is, is that I felt it when I came to BYU-Idaho. And it runs a lot deeper than um, just being around people who are like you. So we are not going to go over this. There's not enough time, but there's this great, I, I want to emphasize how important this idea of belonging and being part of a community is. So this is Emily S. Vahani Smith. She has a great TED talk where she talks about the meaningful life and the meaningful life has four pillars according to her. And all of them are fantastic. I quite, quite like her work. Um, one of them is belonging. And by the way, Arthur Brooks says the same thing. If you're looking at what people do that makes them happy, consistently, the happiest people are the people who belong. They are they have community, they have loved ones, they have relationships. These things are really quite important. Um, you can also find this with Maslow, right? Belonging is one of the the, the great physiological needs. When you um, when you go to scientific research, the there is clear evidence that students do better academically when they belong. But also that's kind of the cart before the horse. That's like saying, well, if we teach kids how to be good people, maybe they'll do better on tests, right? Um, as it turns out, just belonging is good for its own sake. And one of the things that I think that um, public schools don't always do well, um, and I speak as a, as a former public school administrator, um, is that we are not as serious about belonging as we are about math test scores. Um, and I think that's a real a real focus that we could all do better at if we, if we focused on it. So um, my other point is that I don't think that inclusion is um, being taught the right way. Um, President Nelson, President Oaks gave two talks in the last three months. Um, it was actually very fortuitous timing. It was right around the same time that I gave my, uh, my presentation. Um, President Nelson talked about how labels can be beneficial and they can explain some things, but the most important label is that you are a child of God and a disciple of Jesus Christ. Um, I want to emphasize that right now because I think it is key to understanding how belonging works. I don't just think that he was giving a talk on inclusion. I think he was laying out doctrine. Um, he was he was giving commandments essentially about how we how we do this. President Oaks gave a talk at Ensign College where he said very similar things, where he talked about how um, there's the you know there's a video he he used the video of the elevator, which is one of my favorites, where um, a guy goes in. And everybody in there is Confederate and it's it's a candid camera and they look the wrong way. And the person in the middle starts shifting to try to fit in with them instead of doing what was the cultural norm. Um, it's a great video if you haven't seen it. And the whole talk is quite good. President Nelson and President Oaks, I think, are quite concerned about this. Um, I do not think that this is a minor issue. Um, I also think that they are teaching something that is at odds with the way that the world teaches things, which means that it won't always be popular and that's okay. Um, but that if we're looking to figure out what the answer is, I think that's the place to go. So I like to ask questions in terms of eternal law, right? So um, what is what are the laws that govern unity or belongingness or, or whatever that is? Um, and I think what you're going to find is that the, a lot of these things are actually very surprising. You just unmuted, so I, I don't know if you have a comment. I do. <laughs> I, I I have some answers to that question, but but you keep going and then I'll give a couple of my thoughts. No, no, go, go for it. What do you think? I'm curious. Okay, so <laughs> this is something that I've written about uh, on a couple of occasions. And eternal laws, when we think of eternal laws in the gospel of Jesus Christ, uh, one of the laws that we adhere to and that we teach is self-reliance. Hmm. 
uh, which, which means, you know, taking ownership of our well-being, our, uh, our spiritual status, uh, you know, taking responsibility to, to work through issues and grow and, and, and learn and develop. And that is an eternal law. Self-reliance is an eternal law. Uh, learning to not depend upon other people for things. And when it comes to belonging, this is an important law. I, I When I talk about belonging, I, I say that it is a tango and it takes two to tango. It takes the individual, it takes me, and it also takes the community that I want to belong to. And we both have dance steps that we need to learn. Uh, there, there are... I, I, I see among people who have stepped into specific political ideologies, for example, but on both the right and the left, mm -hmm. uh, when they adopt political ideologies and actually make those the lens through which they view the church instead of the other way around, a lot of times they come to church and they feel like they don't belong. It's like, uh, you know, I, I don't feel like I belong. I, I, I feel really strongly that COVID vaccines are a harmful thing and they're terrible because that's what my, you know, my political tribe is teaching me. <laughs> and uh, so I've adopted this narrative about the harmfulness of the vaccines. And now I go to church where people are vaccinated and the first presidency is encouraging vaccination and I no longer belong. I no yeah. longer feel like I belong. And then you have people on the other side saying, oh, the church is not, um, you know, I, I've adopted such and such views on race or, or gender or sexuality or any number of things. And now I go to church and I no longer feel like I belong. Well, uh, those are dance steps that the individual is doing. <laughs> and you know, when, when two dancers are not in sync, as far as their dance steps, all they do is kick each other's feet and there's just clash after clash after clash. And sometimes they end up falling on the floor and, <laughs> yeah. uh, so this, again, the, the ability to take responsibility for my own thinking and my commitments and understand how those affect my sense of belonging, I think that is part of the eternal law of self-reliance, and it definitely applies here. I think you just said something wildly uh, unpopular and totally accurate, um, and that is that you have agency um, and that belonging doesn't happen without that. And by the way, that, that that's a, a deeper deal than I think sometimes people think. That doesn't just mean that uh, to be included, you need to do some work, which I think is the is the very simple level one kind of interpretation. I would also argue that the the more you feel like you belong to a community, the higher expectation the community is. That the the communities that feel like they envelop us and they they wrap us around and we're very close to these people. You know, I I, I taught with a group of teachers um, at my first school um, that was, I mean, we were very different people. Um, and I, I don't think we always liked each other. I know. I, let me, let me rephrase. I don't think they always liked me. Right. Um, we went through something really hard together and gave everything we had for kids. And because of that, we are still close friends today. There is something about doing something very, very hard and sacrificing together. And by the way, I also think that that's part of why politics is very dangerous when you're out campaigning and, and, you know, um, canvassing neighborhoods and stuff, and you're doing everything for a candidate, you do get that feeling of togetherness. And I'm not saying that that's bad, but I'm saying if that's the only thing in your life that you're getting that meaning from, that can be really dangerous. That can, that can be scary. Um, I think what I'm saying is, um, even if you don't, um, see it in a, in, in, even if you don't agree with me politically, I think everyone will agree that high expectation communities create a different order of belonging, like a different order of magnitude of belonging. And so a lot of times people will say, well, I don't like the community because it has norms that are too strict. I don't think that's the issue. I think that it has norms that you don't like. And that's and there's nothing wrong with that, right? There are, there are communities that I don't like. 
There are communities that have norms that I don't want to participate in because the norms are stupid or, or whatever. But you have to weigh that before you get into the community because the norms are part of the community. Let me put that out a little bit differently. And this is something that my friend Jeff Thane has taught me. Um, communities are not built by a member at a time. They're built a norm at a time. And the higher the norms are able to be, the stronger the sense of community becomes, but you also lose people with each norm. <clears throat> I think that that's a really valuable way to look at it. Some people without meaning to will try and take away norms that they don't like, but there are also some people who just keep taking away norms and then the community is basically a, a Facebook group. And that's not useful. A community with no norms does no, no longer feels like a community. You don't feel special. You don't have close friends. And also you don't feel safe. And so the idea that the way to create inclusion is to create a normless society doesn't work in the long run. So, so this is something that is observed uh, a lot in modern Christianity. There are a lot of churches that have said, okay, in the name of belonging, and, and this is when we talk about laws, eternal laws, or, or okay, this, this, or, like, what is the exact, what is the reality of how the universe operates? <laughs> okay. Mm -hmm. And some people have a sentimental idea that there's a law of the universe that if I remove norms, um, I remove expectations and and rules and and those kinds of things, then more people will feel like they belong. And so the more right. of those things I can remove, the more belonging will happen. And a lot of churches and institutions have actually done that. And they've found that they lose members. They, they lose, people just stop coming. There's so much belonging that nobody cares to even attend or, you know, unite together in any way. So uh, this is a very, very important concept. And, and again, this is a law of the universe. You, you can't pretend that it's not real. This is observable right. in religious institutions and other kinds of institutions. Um, I'm, I'm glad that you mentioned that. So I, I'm going to, as you were talking, ideas kept coming to my head. So sorry, I wasn't distracted. I was excited. Um, so I, I wrote a piece called Belonging at Church for Public Square a while ago. Um, and I'll, I'll just quote <clears throat> pretty briefly from it. I call it more than mingling. Um, and this is where... Um, <laughs> Well, I'll, I'll just read it. Some friends of mine did some analysis of data recently that found that those in their church community who are most likely to step away from the faith are also those who feel like they least belong. So what is the remedy to this feeling? My usual mental toolkit is pretty limited. Mix and mingles, linger longers, dinner rotations. Although all good, I write in part because I feel the spirit whispering that such things will not by themselves help and may even hurt. Joseph Smith taught that all blessings are predicated on eternal law. Our efforts at building community can be cheap and hollow like that, sounding brass and tinkling cymbals if they are not based on the right principles. So basically what I'm saying here is if you double down on, you know, the, the, the normal toolkit that we have for belonging, you aren't going to get what you think. Um, and you might even make things worse. There are too many people I know who look around and go, oh, and it, let me actually read this next paragraph. <clears throat> I worked at a school once where we tried every possible inclusion strategy, all to no effect. In fact, the school was so focused on unity that we were constantly afraid that we had offended someone else and began to look for subtle indications that others bore us ill will too. Obsessed with others' perceived slights that, and constantly worried about offending others with our own, our focus increasingly turned away from the students we served and turned to our own petty dramas. In contrast, at another school, we rolled up our sleeves and got to work. With, um, with our collective focus on students, our problems just seemed to fade away. I felt like part of a team. We lost ourselves in the work. We took criticism gladly. We tolerated minor slights knowing we'd done the same to others and hoping that they would forgive us in return. So this is a really important um, principle to me. Um, we belong when we are with other people and have a, a similar conviction about something. Removing those convictions does not actually make things better. Um, I think if we just try to mix and mingle, it'll be a problem. And in fact, um, I like this one. Um, our friends out uh, in Maryland, where I used to live, our friends in Maryland, a friend of us uh, of ours has lived in Maryland and then moved to Utah. And they said, I said, How, how's church? How are things? And they said, you know, it's a little different. I said, well, what do you mean? I said, well, you know, the church is still true and we love it. But in Maryland, our church friends were our family. They were so close because we were in this together. And in Utah, they were church friends. 
because people have actual family and everybody is kind of a member of the church and it's just very different. There's a different feeling between those two that gets at this idea of community and belonging that I think is really valuable. Now, to your point on norms, uh, Nathaniel Givens wrote this great piece uh, just the other day on the strength of moral tension. And the, and the basic idea is um, some things work better when the two values are actually intertwined. And so he gives this really cool example of the, uh, what's it called? Um, the Prince Rupert's Drops, these yep. things, okay? Um, and he talks about these masts that are balanced and in tension on both sides. And if you snap one of them, then the whole mast will tip over. It's the balance, it's the tension of both that actually keeps it upright. Yes. But then the last paragraph is 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 I mean it's it's somber, but it's it's quite powerful. On the other hand, we can find inner tranquility by letting go of virtues one by one until we have a single monstrous mutated virtue left as our idol. This will result in some kind of peace on the inside. No one is calmer than an extremist who has extinguished the last embers of self-doubt and conscience. But the more of us who choose this internally easy path, the less peace will exist between people. Neighbor will contend with neighbor, parents and children will disown each other, and the love of many shall wax cold. If you're looking for a community and you're trying to tear down norms so that you feel comfortable, it's not going to work long run. Right. Um, and I think this is a profound and important point. And by the way, a lot of people will say, especially at BYU Idaho, we have very we're we're more strict than BYU, which kind of surprises people that there is such a school in the universe that could be more strict than BYU. Um, and I defend that very gladly. I, I defend, and and people sometimes ask me about some of the weird rules. Why do we have that one? And sometimes the answer is, I don't know. But I think part of what it does is it says, this is a different place and we're a little bit weird. And we don't, we, you know, we want people to come here because they also want to be weird. And if that's not your thing, that's okay. But know what you're getting into here before you go anywhere else. Yeah, I, so I, I went to BYU Provo. And having grown up in Southern California, I didn't belong in Southern California because I was a, a religious dude who didn't party. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, you know, so if I had been into drugs and, and those kinds of things, I would have belonged a lot more in growing up in Southern California. So when I went to BYU Provo, it was specifically because I wanted the honor code. I wanted it. I wanted to, like that felt like belonging to me. Uh, and, and it was like a breath of fresh air as opposed to what I had grown up uh, in, in Southern California. So uh, just one more thing, you know, when you talk about, uh, you mentioned a minute ago, the ideas, removing the beliefs that, that bring belonging right? And, and what is the effect of that? An analogy that I sometimes give is, imagine I am a marine biologist, okay? <laughs> uh, I'm alluding to Seinfeld here. But yeah, imagine I'm a, um, I'm a marine biologist, and I'm a prominent marine biologist. I'm president of the Association of Marine Biologists of America, right? And I speak at academic conferences. I, I lead these, this organization. And then there comes a time where I start, I, I go on a website like Retraction Watch, where they, re, they uh. publish retractions of academic <laughs> papers. And I start seeing scientific paper after scientific paper being retracted. And all of a sudden I start getting disillusioned with the hard sciences and, and my field of marine biology. And I no longer am confident in, in science as it is practiced, right? I, I might have some trust in, in the basic scientific method, but I no longer really think that science as we practice it is a reliable guide to truth. And I approach my organization, the Associ Association of Marine Biologists, and I say, hey, I still wanna be president of the organization but I'm just going to let you know, I no longer believe in marine biology, what we've been doing. I think uh, it's, it, it, it arrives at, you know, objective truth as, as much as literature does, <laughs> right? Um, wow, that's, that, that's an unkind thing to say. Right. <laughs> or, you know, some other field that's, that, that's laden with subjectivity, right? So, Let's, I was let's about to name six of them. I won't, but yeah. yes, keep going. <laughs> right. So let's imagine that that 
I, I come to my organization and I say, I no longer believe, but I love being president of this organization. I love putting on our annual conferences and stuff. And then our board in, in the organization says, no, we need to remove you from being president of the organization because we are advancing marine biology. And, uh, and you know, we have objectives that we're working toward and, and those can only really be fulfilled by people who believe in what we do. And then I say, okay, fine. You're not going to have me as president, but can I still speak at the conferences? I love speaking and I love hearing people applaud when I give my conference speeches and, and they say, no, we can't have you speaking because you no longer believe in what we do. You've adopted a, a different mindset that, that really detracts from our mission actually. And then I start accusing the organization of, you know, not being kind. Why, why, why can't you accept me for how I am? <laughs> you know, this is, this is just where I've landed. Why can't you accept that? We've, we've worked together on things for decades and now you're telling me that I, I no longer fit in and da, da, da. And so in this example, I, I become, uh, I, I, I'm refusing to take responsibility for my own thought processes and how those contribute to my sense of alienation from this organization, right? And that is a tendency in, in a lot of these discussions of belonging. Again, it, you brought up the word agent before. Agent means somebody who can act rather than just be acted upon by others. And belonging is something that we do. It, it is something that we feel, but it's also an action concept, right? It's something that we do. It's something that we pursue. And so in this example of the marine biologist who no longer believes in the hard sciences, you know, there are consequences to these new frames of mind, these new ideas that I've adopted. And I can't avoid the reality of, of the consequences of adopting these views. There are, there really are consequences. That's it's part of the eternal law that we're talking about. Anyway, keep going. I think I think that's a that's a, a really good analogy. I want to let me let me say a couple of things. I can think of no community with which I share a hundred percent views on everything. So I, I just want to put a little asterisk on yours and just say because I, I love it and I think it's so valuable and it's the right way to think. Um, Jonathan Haidt said something that I thought was great. He was saying he, somebody asked him, "Can a religious person be at a university?" And he said, "Of course they can." But if they're a religious fundamentalist that doesn't believe in the scientific method, no, they shouldn't be. And we should have hard conversations and ask them to leave. And, and everybody was, you know, you, you could hear the crowd kind of tense up. And it's like, that, that, it's just obvious to me. If you don't believe in science, why are you at the, the, the temple of science, right? Like, that's, that's crazy. Right. Um, and there are some people in that, in that kind. And, and let, me, let me be even more clear. There are people who will then say, oh, you need to accept me. But their real goal is to try to change the institution. Right. This is my problem with heterodox economists at, at traditional schools. I have no problem if you're heterodox. If you believe in Austrian economics, cool. If you believe in, um, you know, uh, hyper Keynesianism or even like uh, Marxist economics, okay, fine. But you should label yourself and tell people in the interview, hey, I have different views. I know how to teach standard neoclassical economics, but I'm what I'm not going to do what I'm going to do is present that model, but also present as faithfully as I know how the critiques of that model. Great. I have no problem. It's a transparency issue. Right. It's not an issue of you have to agree with us on everything. But what I have a hard time with is when I see an economics professor who pretends to be, uh, you know, very, very uh, traditional, but really they're actually trying to be a, a, a very quiet missionary or a subversive and, and try and change people's minds. Right. Um, there was, there was a, I hesitate to bring this up, but I, I think it's, I think it's valuable, so I'll share it with a friend, um, I guess. Um, I was on Twitter, and a guy said, it is so hard to be at BYU when you're gay. And I immediately clicked his profile, and I started watching, and I thought, I have friends down there. I have people that I can connect him with. I can guarantee that it's probably hard, and he's obviously feeling like it's hard. Um, I want to help this guy out. Let me just follow his profile for a minute, see if somebody reaches out, see if somebody helps. Maybe I'll DM him. Um, one of the things about Twitter that I understand, but is frustrating is you can't DM someone unless you're both following each other. 
So I was trying to think, I was trying to figure out, okay, how can I tell this guy, hey, there are people who will look out for you if you want to let me know, but in kind of a confidential way. So I'm not, you know, pestering him or anything else. So I just thought about it for a minute. Before I could respond, somebody asked, how can you even go to such a homophobic school? I mean, why would you even go there? It just sounds so awful. And I kind of leaned in and I thought, well, that's an interesting question. Uh, I, you know, I obviously disagree with the premise, but, you know, I'm curious to see what he says. And his response was cheap tuition, good school, and I live for the Twitter drama. Excuse me, the Provo drama. Now, I have no problem with somebody deciding that a school is not the right fit. I have an enormous problem with somebody saying, I am, I don't feel like I belong, I'm being picked on or something like that on the basis that I joined a school just for the tuition and I found that they actually have community expectations with which I don't agree. Right. 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 So right. the fact that somebody doesn't feel like they belong, like, I'm sorry, I don't want you to feel like you don't belong. The agency as part of this is that you have to choose a community that has norms that you agree with. And if you don't, that's okay. And, but, and let, let me let me be more specific here. I often hear people say, oh, well, I think that, you know, the bishop is going to report me and then, then I'm going to get kicked out. And it's like, okay, if you've broken a commandment or if you've broken <clears throat> a specific um, promise that you've made, part of the part of the promise of coming to BYU-Idaho, for example, is there's certain rules that we follow, right? We don't drink alcohol. If you come to school and it's clear that you've been drinking, we're going to have a conversation with you about leaving the school, right? Um, and I, I don't know that it would actually be leaving the school. That, that That's that's probably, uh, my guess is that's a little harsher than it would actually be. It would probably be counseling and like, hey, let's talk through this. But fundamentally, if you're a big fan of partying on the weekends and drinking, there are going to be conversations with you about whether this is the right fit. There's a difference though between a worthiness conversation, which is something that we talk about a lot in our faith, and a fit conversation. My concern with BYU and BYU-Idaho is not worthiness. My concern is fit. And what I mean by that is people are going to a school with which they don't agree, and then they're complaining that it feels like they don't belong in a community. BYU-Idaho is a place where I feel like I belong because we're trying to do something different. We're trying to build a little piece of Zion. We're trying to be a bunch of disciples together, learning, and in a way that is unique and special and beautiful. And that's not something that I can get anywhere else. Right. So, so UCLA and Ohio State and some of these other places they don't have a vision of holiness for right. their students. Right. <laughs> holiness, uh, you know, this, this adherence to God's law, it's, it's just a core, core element of what the BYUs are pursuing for students. And so if that's something that I desire, then... I'm going to feel like I belong at the BYUs. If it's something that feels oppressive to me, then I need to accept responsibility for that and make decisions that are in line with what I think and feel. Bingo. And that might mean well, choosing uh, UC San Diego or you know UCLA or Ohio State or some other school. Now, as a general principle, um, I think that's exactly right. And I, I, I defend it. And I think it's really important. And I am concerned that there's an entitlement to belong. That is a real problem. There's this idea that I can show up, I can not change anything about myself. And if you don't love me and flock to me, and I don't feel super engaged, then then it's your fault. and It's not mine. Right. At the same time, what I want to emphasize is, and that's kind of the, the point of this presentation, there are things that we can do. And in fact, let me let me tell you a um, <laughs> One time in my in my classroom, I like to push students thinking, and um, a student said something that we often say that's really stupid, um, and that is, well, I think parents are all trying their best. And I pushed, and I said, you think parents are all trying their best? She said, well, yeah, every parent's trying their best. And I said, really? Why do we have to call CPS on parents then? And I wasn't trying to be mean, and it wasn't a very nice thing to say. I mean, I was, I was being the jerk professor who was really trying to push a student. And she said, well, I mean, not all parents. I said, good. That's a noble myth that we tell ourselves. And by the way, you need to tell yourself that. Because if you go into school saying um, parents aren't trying their best, it's the parents' fault, you're going to be a terrible teacher, and you're going to start to judge parents really hardcore. And that is not the kind of teacher I want. So let me be clear that you need to repeat to yourself every day, three times before you go in, after you go in and, and during your lunch break, parents are trying their best. Every parent is trying their best. It's a noble myth. I do not believe it is true. Some parents are not trying their best. And frankly, I think that we, 
as public educators need to do a better job of finding a way to partner with parents. And, and by partner, what I'm, what I'm trying to say is to say, hey, we need you on our side. Well, this is a fit issue. This is an issue of we are pulling as hard as we can for your kids. We need you to be pulling for them as hard as they can too. The reason I bring up this noble myth idea um, is that um, it is imperative that as a university faculty, I be asking myself the question as though it's 100% on me. How can I help my students belong? Cannot go back to, well, what they need to do is, even though there are things that they need to do. And so the eternal law has to be taught. You have to start with, what are you doing? What decisions are you making? Um, I honestly think that one of the things that uh, this is, I'm getting, I mean, it's a podcast. I can say whatever I want, right? Um, this is just my opinion. I think one of the things that I worry about with BYU and BYU-Idaho is that the tuition is so cheap that people are going for the wrong reason. I think if you're really serious about belonging, I would up the tuition. And I would do it in a way where you take all of that money that you make and you give scholarships to the very poor students who are applying. But I don't want students coming to a school because it's going to be a cheap degree. I want them coming because it's something unique and special. And maybe you keep the tuition low and that's fine. Maybe you you jack up the requirements for community service, right? And, and you make them do something really meaningful where, you know, I love seeing students who work on campus. I love how hard and like our campuses are beautiful. BYU and BYU-Idaho, I love walking around. It's perfectly curated. There's flowers everywhere. I would love to see, and, and, and I say this looking back on myself, a young Ben Pacini at BYU would have benefited so much from being made to, at, unpaid, be required to work on the grounds crew five hours a week, right? Do something physical to contribute back to what you are getting at an extremely reduced cost, because that's just part of what we do. I think there's something about that that feels really right to me. And so maybe, maybe the answer isn't to jack up tuition. Maybe the issue is to require a little bit more from people. Um, but it's the same idea of, you know, I, I want you to be here if you really want to be here. And if not, you might not be as happy as you think. All right, let me let me keep going. Um, let's see, there was a third line. Oh, I we, we kind of already talked about this. Common cause and high expectations are the fabric of communities. And some people will complain. And by the way, I'm not defending every single rule. Um, there's there's kind of a, a funny thing that uh, a student asked me the other day. They said, why, why is this this rule in here? Um, and I give a little presentation on the honor code in my classes and, and, and the dress and grooming standards are always the biggest part of the honor code that everybody wants to talk about. Um, and I said, well, there's this principle called, um, called being a good guest, being a, being a guest in someone else's home. When I went to Rome and I went into the Vatican, there were certain rules about how I was to dress. Um, when I went to Israel and I went to the Western wall, there were rules about what I needed to wear on my head. Now, I don't believe in that. That's not something that is part of my dress, but I did it because it was somebody else's sacred place. That's how BYU-Idaho is. So maybe some of these rules don't fit for you and that's good. That's fine. Okay. I, 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 I can understand that. Sometimes we're still doing it because it's not our house. And by the way, I have yet to find there, there are LDS students and there are non-LDS students at BYU-Idaho. I have yet to have a non-LDS student push on the honor code or dress and grooming standards. In every case, they have said, yeah, I knew what I, what I was getting into when I signed up. It's kind of like you would, never put your, you would never put your feet up at grandma's house, but you'll do it at your own house. It's that kind of a feeling where because, well, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm a member of the church. I can do whatever I want to. That's just a stupid rule. But if you were at a Catholic university and they said, well, we actually need you to do this, you know, weird thing. That's the same thing as at BYU-Idaho. We wouldn't grumble so much. I think that perspective is really helpful. Yes. I agree. <laughs> okay, I, you, you unmuted, so I was, I was, I, I, I stopped, and I gave you a good pause, so you could keep going. No, okay. I, I totally agree. Um, I, this is a joking slide, but I, I, that was a good discussion. Sorry, we're already at an hour, so this is going to be a good long, uh, long form one. I can already tell. Um, I jokingly said, you know, what, what builds uh, community, and uh, with, with my folks, I said, you know, I think it's fifteen percent calorie intake, five percent humor, and eighty percent discipleship. Um, and that's a nice way of saying food works. Uh, like if you're planning a youth activity, make sure there's good food there. Um, if you're planning for a great class, uh, make sure you've got some funny memes. If somebody asked me, how do you build community in your classrooms? I would say, well, I throw candy at kids and I have memes, but I want to emphasize that you can't build a cake out of icing, right? At the end of the day, the reason why you're there is to learn from me as a professor about education. And if you're mad that I'm teaching education and not physics, you're going to have a rough experience. That yeah. feeling of high expectations is core to the experience. So, so, so one of my favorite TV shows is The Dog Whisperer. 
Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. So one of the things that you'll see Caesar do sometimes is when when you have dogs that aren't getting along, he'll go out on these roller skates and he'll have them run together in the street. Huh. And he'll kind of, it, it's like just that, uh, it, it's a team building exercise for the dogs. We do something together that it's not conflict. Yep. We have a purpose. We're going to go for two or three miles of physical activity together. And then the dogs come home and they're like, okay, <laughs> right? <Yeah. laughs> they, because we did a thing. Yeah, they, they go out and they do something that doesn't involve looking at each other and thinking about each other, right? Yeah. So one of my very, very favorite church callings uh, to this day has been when I was in college, I was called as a service project coordinator for my ward. Oh, that's cool. Oh my gosh. It was amazing. We would go out and do service projects in the community and everybody who came bonded, right? Unity happened because we were doing something good. Hmm. If we sit or if we were to sit around and talk about unity rather than going out and doing things, you know, we, we wouldn't have achieved much of unity by just sitting and, and talking about it. Right. Uh, so that's an important lesson. If, if you're a church leader or a leader of any organization, if you want to build unity and belonging, go do something good together. Yeah. Get outside yourselves. Focus on something, on helping some you know, vulnerable people in your community, something like that. And you will see belonging and unity emerge organically. When, when my kids are fighting with each other, <clears throat> I will, I will try two things. First, I will say, do you think you can work it out or do you want me to give a consequence? And I don't do that every time because sometimes they really do need me. But if it seems to me like it's something that they could do, if they put their minds to it and we're a little bit more gracious and work together. And now they're at the point where um, Andrew and Izzy, my, my, my two middle children, um, have made a pact that they always auto forgive each other so they don't have to get in trouble. Right. So they'll bring something to me and they'll say, she did the thing. And he, she's like, well, but he did the thing. And I was like, all right, well, do you want me to? And they'll say, nope, never mind. We forgot. I, I love you. I forgive you. How can I fix it? You can hug me. Okay. And they give each other a hug and they walk away. And it's great because they actually are happy. They feel like they're cheating the system when that's the whole reason for the system. Right. Um, now, let me let me add to this. This is not something that I put in the BYUI presentation because it's my it's much more of my personal opinion and it's a little bit more political. Um, the, the story I told about being at a school where uh, diversity, equity, and inclusion didn't work is a very real one. And it is a critique of diversity, equity, and inclusion. I am concerned broadly that the more we focus on everyone feeling accepted, you don't get there that way, right? You get there 20%, right? That's what I'm talking about. But you yeah. will you, you will in fact make things worse over time because you lose your focus on the students who are in your school. Um, and by the way, everybody at that school had good intentions. I'm not saying that somebody was, you know, it's some secret, evil secret cabal of, of people who are trying to undermine unity, nothing, nothing like that at all. I think it's a much more organic thing, which is that you lose focus on what actually matters, which is we are going to stay here until late at night and work really hard because we love kids and we want them to have an amazing educational experience. Those are the schools at which people belong. And it's not that they don't have beef. It's not that they don't have drama. It's that it, the drama doesn't matter as much as the common cause that we have. Right. Um, this also relates to my masculinity project, which I've told you about a couple of times. Um, for some reason, and I don't know fully why, I'm not defending the idea that norms are kind of associated with masculinity and like mercy, like justice is masculine and mercy is feminine. I think that's, that's weird. Um, but that's how we think about it. That is what is in the culture. And so norms are right now bad because for some reason, when I list all of the so-called masculine traits, they're all negative things. When in fact, I think that the, the pendulum has swung way too far, norms are good. They can go too far. Um, you, can, you can get to a place where it's militaristic. And I don't think that's healthy. That's not what I want for BYU-Idaho. And at the same time, I think that some level of norms are, are healthy and good. Anyway. Um, all right. So Elder Renlund gave this talk um, that I, and, and this quote is, is really good. After the Savior's visit to the Americas, the people were unified. There was no contention in all the land. Do you think that the people were unified because they were all the same or because they had no differences of opinion? I doubt it. Instead, contention and enmity disappeared because they placed their discipleship of the Savior above all else. Their differences paled in comparison to their shared love of the Savior, and they were united as heirs to the kingdom of God. 
The result was that there could not be a happier people who had been created by the hand of God. Let me put this in a different terminology. If you were trying to unite, well, and, and this is this is one where um, a friend of mine said something that I quite liked. Um, why not create spaces for students where they can um, be around people like them? So like, um, you know, a, a, a uh, an Italian-American student association for Ben Pacini, right? And and we all sit down as Italian-Americans and we make pasta together. Um, and the answer is because it it emphasizes, um, and, and I won't repeat his stuff because he's he's got a better answer, I think, than mine, but um, I think it emphasizes the wrong part of community, right? It doesn't emphasize the common cause. It emphasizes something that is secondary. And like, do I have a problem with people getting together if they happen to be like each other? No, not at all. That's something that happens all the time. It's really interesting to me that, you know, with by, by by complete accident, most of the Facebook groups that I am in, except for my Facebook groups for my church, all happen to be mostly male. And I don't know why that is, right? I'm, I, I actually prefer to have a much more diverse set of opinions, but it's just the nature that we somehow self-select culturally in very weird ways. Um, there's a, an article I read a while ago that said that um, the church pews are still the most segregated place in America. Um, for some reason, black people go to, to to different churches than white people, and it's just it's just, it's very well known, and it's it's very it's a hard problem to solve because, as it turns out, people tend to flock together. Now, I don't think that that is necessarily wrong. I have no problem with an HBCU. I've thought about that a lot, and I think there's a, there's actually something that, to me, uh, BYU Idaho is very similar in having a common purpose and a common identity, and I think that's great. But at the end of the day, the goal is still to go to school. At the end of the day, being in church, the purpose is still primarily, first and foremost, to be a disciple of Jesus Christ. And if you put anything above that, that's going to be a problem long run. That doesn't mean that the other labels aren't important. I'm not saying that you shouldn't refer to them or think of yourself. I think that they add to our identity in beautiful and important ways. But the first and most important priority is that we identify as disciples of Jesus Christ. Right. So if I go to church and I say church is primarily a stage for me to play out my personal psychodrama and my political ideology and all of those kinds of things, then I, I'm going to, it's going to be walking into a buzzsaw every single Sunday, uh, right? I'm, I'm going to go in and just be outraged. Why isn't everybody accepting me? Why do I not belong? And I'm going to develop this victim mindset and you know, a martyr complex. Oh gosh, this community is so terrible. They don't agree with me. They don't accept me and, and all those kinds of narratives. Uh, you can't, you can't avoid this reality. Like if we have to be cognizant of what we bring to this equation of belonging. Bingo. If my purpose in going to church is discipleship, it is to learn the gospel. It is to feel the spirit and love other people and serve other people, belonging is going to organically happen without mm -hmm. me trying, without me seeking it, because I have the right purpose. Mm -hmm. So, Well, and, and the example of this gets back to Elder Kieran. I have been, I, I, I don't remember if I, I told this, you know, I think it was in my essay. I lived in Italy and when I was, <clears throat> I, I remember crying um, before I left for Italy, I was crying in my bed. I was just really scared and I, I wanted to have friends. Um, and I was leaving my friends and it was hard. And I was a 13 year old kid and I love my friends. And my dad heard me and he came in and he, he was so kind and so gentle. And he said, you know, you're going to go to an American school. We're going to make sure you have good friends. Um, but we're also doing this because we feel like heavenly father needs us to go. Um, and I think that's what I needed to hear. Um, I went there under the assumption that I would really click with my American friends and I would get to know my Italian friends over time. When what actually happened was um, it was Italian saints who I became closest with the fastest because we share something that's very different. We share something that's unique. And those friends are still my bosom buddies, right? My, my closest people. And I'm, I get along fine with my school friends. It wasn't that they were bad. But it it very much shifted my mentality around this idea of belonging. It is not about belonging with people like you. It's belonging with people who are willing to sacrifice for the cause that you're also willing to sacrifice from. Now, let me also mention something. One of the things that I have noticed here in, in Idaho, and I, I knew it in Utah as well, is um, one of the great things about the church is that it comes with a community built in. So um, 
we have a couple of folks in our neighborhood who are not members of the church. And we were planning a, a party. And I said, hey, could we make this a community party? And they said, oh, yeah, for missionary work. And I said, no, explicitly not for missionary work. I think most people in Rexburg, Idaho know uh, about the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints and can probably find a missionary. I, and, and, and if missionary work happens, great. I'm not, you know, I'm, I'm a big believer in my church and, and it's great. I think everybody should be a member. But what will happen over time is that if our community becomes our church and our church is our community, then those people who are in the area but aren't a member of the church are also out of the community. And that's something that I want to prevent in any way that we possibly can. How can we make sure that there is a place and a space for them to come and participate? And then the other example of this is when somebody leaves the church, we sometimes complain that they, you know, they get caught up in a bad community or, or they get really angry and, and all of that stuff. Well, when you lose a community, you need to find a, a new community. And one of the things I would argue, and by the way, I have friends who have left and I would, I would say that they have left well. I don't want anybody to leave. I love my, my church. I believe in the gospel. But I have friends who have left well. And one of the things I, I consistently see them do is say, I'm going to deliberately choose a community that is focused on building a, a, a new set of beliefs, a new set of, you know, to the extent that it makes sense, a new set of morality. And some, some people, they're, they're, they're fine with where they are. Um, I, I don't say a better form or a worse form. I'm not, I'm not saying that if you leave the church, you're a bad person and you're immoral, but there are going to be some shifts. And the people who have done really well are not focused on becoming the anti-community. They're focused on creating a new community and a better life and being right. deliberate and moving on in a healthy way. And I think that there's something really valuable about that. Yep. All right. So um, Elder Cook um, put this very directly and I, I it was mind blowing for me. This is one that, you know, illumination directly to my, to my head. When people love God with all their hearts and righteously strive to become like him, there's less strife and contention in society. There's more unity. Now that sounds really basic, right? It sounds really straightforward until all of a sudden it clicked. He's talking about order, right? Righteously strive to become like him leads to less strife, right? If you pursue unity, you don't get there. If you pursue discipleship, then you do. What's the, what's the, I remember there's this really awkward graphic from like the nineties where if a husband and wife want to become more unified, one of the best ways they can do it is by focusing on their discipleship. And by the way, I will defend, I mean, the, the graphic was kind of funny because it, it looks like, you know, there are three people in the marriage, but, um, this is something that I will defend. I strongly believe that it is true. If you and your spouse are looking to become more unified, you do it in a common project and something that you're willing to give a lot to. Um, well, we've talked about this a lot, but it's been really good. Um, I want to now shift to who doesn't belong. Um, by the way, these are not real students at BYU-Idaho. This is stock footage. Um, <clears throat> but I, I talked to a friend and I said, who do you think doesn't belong at BYU-Idaho? He said, well, you know, I, I suspect that uh, it's probably, you know, LGBTQ students, they might feel like they don't belong. Um, and I'll bet black students, you know, there, there's, you know, history of racism in the church and, you know, they, you know, it's a very, very white institution and it is, right? Um, I will say that it's a little bit more diverse than people think because we have so many Pathway International students. Um, and it's actually great. Like, I love that part of, of, of BYU-Idaho. But I, I, I absolutely think that it is possible that these folks don't, don't fit in and it's something to be aware of. Um, what I want to raise, however, is that that is a pretty narrow view. Um, I did some talking and and uh, a little bit of research with a couple of friends of mine and, and said, okay, who are the students who might not feel like they belong? And here's my very short list. One of my students was waking up at 2 a.m. in the morning and Zooming in from the Philippines. Um, I had a student who was divorced and uh, I had another student who was in a, an abusive situation. Imagine the student who comes home early from his mission uh, for medical reasons. Imagine the missionary who comes home from his mission for not medical reasons. Uh, imagine the student who's a first-gen college student. Imagine the student who's just a little bit quiet. Imagine the student who has a lot of anxiety. Imagine the perfect kid four out of seven days of the week. I don't think that we are very, in fact, I would argue that college is a little bit like middle school where we think that everybody else feels like they totally fit in when no one actually does, right? The popular kids do not actually fit in nearly as well as we all assume. And I think that once we recognize that, it's actually very humbling and we realize, you know what, let's all realize that, that we should just be friends and kind and, and do our best to, to listen to each other and fit in. Um, but I especially wanted to talk about this because I'm going to talk a little bit about race and LGBTQ students because it's, it's very much something that's important to me. But if you leave this going, oh, inclusion is about LGBTQ students, I've done a disservice. That's not fair. Um, you know, there, there's something a lot deeper about a lot of this. 
Okay. Key point. There are many who don't feel that they belong. Some of the best ways to help people are, oh, this is... <clears throat> In education, we have something called the RTI pyramid. Now, I'm not going to go super in-depth, but you can think of it like this. You've got kids who are in tier one. They don't need a lot of extra help. They just need to go to class every day and they'll be fine. That's like 80, 90% of your kids. Then you've got tier two students who are like, they need a little bit of extra help. And then you've got tier three students. They're in the red, right? It's green, yellow, red. The red students need a lot of support. So they might get pulled out. They might get one-on-one -on -one supports. And I went to a training once that blew my mind. It was fantastic. One of the things that somebody said was, um, it was it was an ESL, how to, how to teach students who are learning English as a second language. And the teacher wrapped up and somebody raised their hand. And this was a, you know, a three hour presentation. Somebody raised their hand and said, well, but you just, everything you've taught us is just good teaching. And she clicked the next slide and it had a big bold letters. E great ESL teaching is just good teaching. Um, the number one way to help your tier two and tier three students is to keep them tier one by teaching really, really effectively to begin with. If you think, oh, there's that one student in my class who might feel like they don't belong, let me narrowly target them and awkwardly ask them to come to my office so that we can belong better. A, it's really awkward for them. B, I'm not sure that it's gonna be successful. But also what about the other students in the class who look like regular white Mormon Rexburg students, but might feel like they really need a friendship or might need a group to help them and, and, and look out for them? So this is something that I think is really important. Some of the best ways to help people along are just good teaching. So I, I, I firmly, firmly believe this as well. I, I think for church leaders who are looking to increase a sense of belonging in wards, this is the, the organizational dance steps, right? Right. You have right. the individual who has, I have my dance steps for belonging and then the community has dance steps. The church experience, something that church leaders can do is they can raise the quality of teaching and discussion in a ward. Yep. For teachers, that means absolutely making sure that teachers are familiar with the church's messaging around race, around sexual minorities, around uh, a lot of these things that tend to be pain points for people in terms of belonging, just making sure that all of your teachers are able to put forward the very, very best, highest quality messages about all of these kinds of things so that they don't create, you know, these super awkward, horrible situations that happen all the time at church. Uh, if we just raise the quality of teaching, you're you're really, really going to increase these. You're actually going to decrease things that detract from belonging. Yes, that is something you can do at church. Well, and I, and I would so <clears throat> I love that, and I completely agree. Um, there's a research article that I really like that finds that if if people go to church for external reasons. Um, which is to say because they're forced to or for social reasons or because they have to keep up with the spiritual Joneses, um, they have really negative mental health outcomes. Um, if your parents are forcing you to go, to go to church, it's actually bad for you, right? So external, um, and, and I, I would say, so a, a framework that I point to a lot is vertical versus horizontal faith. Oh, it, interesting. Okay. Yeah. So so it's, it's uh, I, I guess what you're saying kind of dovetails with horizontal faith. I'm going and I'm just looking around at who's around me and my church experience, the quality of it depends on the people around me rather than the vertical experience of communing, uh, you know, communion with God. I, I think that's a, that's a fabulous way to say it. Well, and, and the opposite is, you know, <clears throat> the people who have the best experiences are going for internal reasons. They're going for the transcendent, for the divine, to, to, to worship their Lord and Savior. If you are going to church for the right reasons, you will have positive outcome experiences on average. And I think that's what, I, like, I, I'm not saying, by the way, that you should let your kids decide starting at age eight, right? Like, oh, well, if you don't want to go to church, I'm not going to make you. But my kids know that that's an expectation. They're going to go to church. But starting around age eight, nine, and 10, I start preaching to them very vocally. Like, I hope you're going for the right reason. Like, you're going to have to go while you're my kid in my house, but I, I can't make you when you're 40. I hope that at some point you start, and, and by the way, and I, I will say this, 
Arthur Brooks and Emily Esfahani Smith, I've mentioned them earlier. Both of them find the same thing that, that one of the four big things that brings the meaningful life is transcendence, morality, philosophy, um, these deep religious experiences. I think that there are, I am more, let me put it this way. People might think that I'm talking about people who have left the church. I am more worried about people who are going to church and are not feeling anything than I am about people who have left the church. Good luck, have fun, God bless. Good. Like, I really just want you to have a good life, right? I have deep personal convictions about the gospel. We, we can disagree and still be friends. I am very concerned that there are people in church right now who are going out of social convenience and they don't understand the power. And, and, and to your point, the number one thing that a bishopric can do to make sure that um, great belonging is happening is look at your sacrament meetings. Are people leaving with tears in their eyes and full hearts? Are people leaving feeling like they have been changed? Because if that's happening, you're not going to have to worry about anything else. Yep. Look at your uh, talk with your Sunday school presidency. Yeah. And make sure that they understand all of the church's resources on challenging issues. Yeah. And they can make a huge impact on a sense of belonging in a ward. Just no, raising I, I, the quality of teaching. I, I completely agree. Let me let me add a thought to that. A friend of mine was bothered because I we were doing um, Bishop's Youth Firesides for the for the kids, you know, 13 to 18, roughly. And I always wanted to do these juicy topics because that's kind of my thing. I really like, I, I heard from a friend, I haven't confirmed this, but somebody said that, you know, people generally leave the church over three issues, um, personal trials, like difficult things, somebody dies or divorce or, you know, something like that. Number two is um, testimony issues. So church history and scriptures. Um, and the third is social issues. Now, um, I would argue that the first two we know about, and we have ministers for one, and we have lots and lots of teaching resources for the second. I don't think anybody is doing anything for the third one. And so I spend a lot of time thinking about, and I think it really is a community issue more than it is an ideology issue, right? I don't feel like I belong because I'm a center left member of the church. No, no, no. You, We need center left members of the church, like desperately need. Because as it turns out, you're, you're, you're a great piece on this, right? We need people who are focused on compassion, who are skeptical of authority. That, that, that to me is actually a very, very important part of creating a body of Christ that is whole. Um, and at the same time, I also, so, so my, my whole shtick was to always talk about the social issues. And uh, a member of the ward council just said, hey, you know, I, I think that's fine, but I don't want my kids to have a testimony um, that the social issues won't, won't lead them out of the church. I want them to have, have a testimony that Jesus Christ is their savior. And so we need to engage in the hard topics, but it also can't become the core of everything that we do. At the end of the day, teaching doctrine is the most important, right? Teaching the truths of the gospel that change lives. Right. Um, all right. So <laughs> this is one that I, that I, I feel like is important and, and no one likes, uh, but I think is probably the, the thing that sticks in most people's craw. I suspect that some people won't like my presentation and that's fine. I'm sure that somebody on Twitter might, might take issue with it. Let me observe that I think there's a fa false dichotomy going on here. Um, somebody actually asked, um, what's your lean? Uh, you know, wh which way are you going with this? Are you kind of going for the church doctrine side? Or are you going for the, like, we need to, you know, be activists for the LGBTQ students. Um, and my answer was, well, m you know, both, I guess. Right. There's an idea out there that you have to choose between these, and that has not been my experience. I was I was an administrator for for four years, and never once did I have to choose between um, welcoming LGBTQ students and helping them to feel included, um, and standing up for what I believed in. I never had to choose between being a disciple and being a disciple. As it turns out, that's a false choice, um, and I would argue that it's actually really important that we conceptualize it that way. That we are not being asked to choose between these two things. And by the way, the world is increasingly saying, no, you have, if you don't agree with me, you don't love me. To which you can answer, no, I can love you and disagree with you on things. And also making me agree with you in order to feel like you belong is not healthy because there are a lot of people out there who don't belong, belong or, or, or who, who aren't going to agree with you and you're going to feel like you don't belong with them. Um, if the expectation is that the only way to do that is if we agree on every single thing. Um, and this is where you hear people say, well, you're your beliefs are fundamentally uh, dehumanizing to, to LGBTQ people or, you know, something like that. First of all, it's very hyperbolic. It's, it's just very overstated. Um, but second of all, I think it's a really dangerous message long-term. I think people are going to look around and go, you know, I'm not sure, you know, let me put it this way. There's a group of people who think I'm going to hell that I get along with splendidly. 
Um, and that's my Catholic friends. I, and I, to be clear, I don't know if they, they think I'm going to hell or if I'm just going to purgatory. Like, I, I don't know the doctrine. I'm, I'm not accusing them of anything. Every Catholic I've ever met has been really pleasant with me. They, they're not hateful towards me. Um, and I don't think gay people are going to hell, just to be clear. Like, I, I'm not even going that far. But this idea that we have to agree on things or we don't or, or we can't be friends and we can't get along. If if that is a problem, that's OK. What I'm arguing here is that it's a false dichotomy and we need we need to start separating that out. Um, and we need to say it to our students because a student will come to you and um, a student came to me and said, you know, I get some ally vibes from you. I, I really like that. I'm, I'm glad that you're an ally. I said, well, uh, I, I thanks, I think, uh, but I don't want to disappoint you. OK, uh, I, I want you to know up front, I will support you in every way I possibly can. And at the same time, I am not neutral on the restored gospel of Jesus Christ. I'm not neutral on the family proclamation either. So I don't want you to feel like I'm pulling the rug out from under you. I'm, not, you know, I, I'm a nice guy. I, I, I can be pleasant to get along with, let's say. I don't want you to feel like I'm talking out both sides of my mouth. I need you to understand that this is really both for me. Um, so this is this is a, a comment that I, I, I put in my original article that I think is the the reason why people ask me to give this talk. Um, safe means so I, I talk about how I want students to feel safe in my classroom. Safe means that slurs, derogatory comments, or hurtful responses will be addressed directly and, if appropriate, publicly. When asked, students often report that these comments are the most significant factor in making them unsafe. I will not tolerate such. That's easy for me. I was an assistant principal. If somebody said a slur, we send them to the principal's office, and they got in big trouble, um, right? Like, well, they send them to my office, and I got them in big trouble. That's the right thing to do. Um, by the way, uh, punishment is a bad thing, but I don't think it really is. I think it's actually really good to punish kids for the like healthy punishment proportional punishment, punishment that is useful and logical. And like, as soon as we think about it for 10 seconds, we realize that it's a bad way to think to say, oh, all punishment is bad. No, you're being dumb. Okay. But safe does not mean neutral. I am fully on the side of the restored gospel. If you were in my class, you will hear me preach the restoration, particularly the doctrine of the family, for which I have a strong testimony that comes from academic, spiritual, and personal experience. I, I've lived too long to pretend that family isn't important. I've lived too long to think that sexuality isn't a big deal. And that it's fine and we should just do whatever we want to. That is not my opinion. That doesn't mean I, I'm, I, and I, I mean, very seriously, if somebody's treating you wrong, I'm going to, I'm going to come for them, right? I, I don't have a lot of patience for that. But if you think that that means that I also have to agree with you on matters of sexuality, that's just not right. Um, and I, I don't feel any obligation to do otherwise. Okay. <laughs> this is great. That's a false dichotomy. Yes, but we have to embrace false dichotomies because the only alternative is cannibalism. Oh, um, boy. Right? I, right. Like I love this idea. And I, I play this game with my students where, where I'll do false dichotomies all semester and I'll help them to start to see what it is. And it's actually really freeing, right? They start to realize that um, actually there are other choices. And, you know, this is kind of the, the, the narrative is if you're gay and in the church, then you either leave or you hide it and you're closeted and you're miserable. And it's like, sorry. And by the way, I, I know that those are two choices that people have gone through. I respect those people and I, I wish them luck and I want them to, to figure it out and, and make peace with it. But those are not the only two choices. And in fact, the people I know who are thriving have not made those choices, right? Like, well, I shouldn't, some people who have left are, are, are glad that they have and I respect that, right? But there are a lot of people who've chosen to stay who have a variety of other options and they feel really good about. And so rejecting the false dichotomy, I think is really, really important. So, so uh, I'll just add, there are a lot of false dichotomies in gospel discussions. And, uh, it, you know, one of those is the scriptures are the word of God or they are imperfect. Uh, Completely false. <laughs> right. So for, for the scriptures to be the word of God means that God will speak to us through the scriptures. Right. Regardless of, you know, Moroni says, gosh, please overlook all our human weaknesses in producing these texts, right? Because he knows that that nobody's going to be perfect about, uh, you know, producing scripture. So the scriptures, especially restoration scripture, we have a lot of references to imperfections and records and stuff like that. They're, they're really kind of setting our expectations. And I... Uh, God still speaks to us through the scriptures, regardless of, you know, the human dimension and how they're produced. But for a long time, I thought it was just, just plain and simple, you know, a, a dichotomy, like 
you either either the scriptures are flawless and pristine and perfect or they are not from god and this is in evangelical christianity you know this idea of scriptural in inerrancy they they have to kind of adhere to that and it causes a lot of problems for them the gospel has a lot of these kinds of dichotomies and and this is one of them belonging is a subject where we run into a lot of false dichotomies so i really like this well and especially the weaponized one yes so let me let me emphasize this piece which i think is really really dangerous um and i i want to be sensitive about this um one of the things that i have been told before is you are going to cause gay people to commit suicide um i want to emphasize how dangerous that is okay first of all everyone wants to prevent suicide okay so accusing somebody otherwise is I think very, very troublesome to me because it's 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 not just assuming ill intent, it's assuming the worst intent. And I have seen that, right? Now this is Twitter stuff, right? People are dumb on Twitter, but I still wanna you know, raise my voice of warning against it. What, but, but even setting aside the assuming of bad will, it's also creating a narrative that I think is really dangerous, right? If you're a gay kid in the church and you keep hearing about, oh, you're gonna make kids commit suicide. Well, then what do you think when you come out of the closet? Instead of, hey, it could be hard, like, like even just changing it to, I strongly disagree with you. What you are doing could be really harmful. Okay. Now we can have a conversation because, and by the way, I'm not, I know of anecdotal cases where it is absolutely the case that it has caused suicidality. I'm not, I'm not pretending that's not real, but I'm not willing to go so far as to say that it should be the default narrative. That is very concerning. And I think everything I know about social contagion, everything that I know about the way that this kind of stuff spreads says that it's really dangerous, that you are building a, you know, kind of a neural pathway for kids. It, it's very similar to school shootings. The more you talk about it, the more kids think about school shootings and the more that it spreads. This is what I mean when I talk about emotional contagion. I think that we need a narrative for, for LGBTQ folks in and out of the church um, that is very different from this, that, that says, hey, there's, you know, yes, it can be hard and that's real, but there are ways to thrive. And, and I would prefer people to have, you know, look, even if it's the narrative of, it could be really hard and drive people out of the church. Fine. That, that, that's a much, not fine, but that's a much better story to be telling. People will be able to leave the church and thrive and find a better way. And to be clear, I think that they can thrive in the church. But when you, when you default to suicidality, not only do I think that it's an unfair, like it's not a, it's, you know, it's, it, it goes against civility. It's also really dangerous. Right. Um, I agree. Anyway. Okay. Um, Clark Gilbert said this, we're, we're shifting gears. Uh, Clark Gilbert said nothing about suicidality. That was, that was red hot spicy. And he was saying, you know, that, that was me. That was not Clark Gilbert. So if you're mad about it, then be mad at me. Individuals or groups who do not treat our LGBTQ members with empathy and charity are not aligned with the teachings of the church of Jesus Christ. Love this. One of the reasons why I, I tried to, the, one of the ways I tried to give this presentation um, like I said, I, I was trying not to speak out both sides of my mouth, but I was trying to say, say it in powerful enough language that a conservative Ezra Taft Benson worshiping, you know, the, the UN as a communist cabal kind of member of the church, strong, you know, El Elder Bruce R. McConkie books all on the shelves could listen to this and go, oh, wow, I really, really need to stand up and protect my LGBTQ brothers and sisters. Yep. I wanted to make sure that no matter where they were, that they understood that they have obligations to the Savior and to the church that they represent. Um, and at the same time, there's another obligation. At the same time, ignoring God's laws has never been the Savior's pattern for showing love. Remember, Jesus asked us to love God first. That no matter how left-leaning my friends were, that they recognize that there is some obligation to stand up and say, I love this church and I believe in it and I defend it. That I'm here not by accident, but because I, I feel God in this church. And there might even be teachings I disagree with. I'm not going to preach about those to you because there's a loyalty aspect to this, right? I, I think that both that this has an ask for all of us in, in this that I think is really valuable. So um, there's an asterisk here that I think is important. This is where we get to the, to the meat um, of the presentation. And it's not that meaty, but um, the asterisk is because I, I, I reached out to, to four or five LGBTQ friends, students, and, and, and colleagues, and I just said, hey, what would you want if you could have anything. If, uh, if I could deliver a, a message to faculty, what would you ask? And, and I was really appreciative. They, they, they reached out and they, they said, you know, I really appreciate that. Um, and here's some of the things that they said. Number one, preach the gospel. Uh, that may sound like a surprise, but let me clarify. Please teach what the actual gospel says and not your personal headcanon. 
One of the things that we hear quite often, actually, is that professors will try and go beyond church teachings and kind of give their own personal view of how things are. Well, I think that gay people are gay because, look, there's no good way to end that sentence. You've already dug yourself into a pit and you should have stopped, right? We There are a lot of things we don't know, and sticking with current church teachings is really valuable. Now, and I'll add to that, um, <clears throat> one of my colleagues shared with students, um, you can be gay and have a temple recommend and have a full, you know, that you can have full activity in the church and there's no worthiness issue. And he asked it as a true and false. And it was like 30 or 40% of his students that, that got the answer wrong. So sometimes I think there's this idea that, well, we don't, that preaching the gospel is, is too simple. We need to, we need to go deeper. You'd be shocked at how much we need to teach the basics. I think that teaching that there's like, I think that I've probably heard a thousand times there, the, the law of chastity is real. It is valid. It is valuable. And there is no sin in your orientation and who you were attracted to. I think just repeating that still needs to be done for years to come. I think that is a really, really valuable message. Um, the other thing that I was told that surprised me was a student actually came to me and said, actually, it was a relief to know where you stood because I knew where you were and it wasn't awkward and you didn't, you didn't, you weren't walking on eggshells. We knew where we both stood and that was really great. And I agree with that. I would imagine that it would be better for me to know where somebody stood too. That gets back to my, to my communist uh, economics professor that I, that I was joking about earlier. I don't mind if somebody has different views, but I want them to be transparent about them. I want somebody to say, I'm not a neoclassical economist, right? I have heterodox views. And if you're in this class, you'll hear some of them, but my goal is to teach you the best that I know how. Number two, this is from a talk that I love by, by Blake Fisher. Um, somebody said, well, you know, Blake, it'll all work out. You'll get married. And he very gently said, you know, maybe I will, but if I don't, it will still be okay. My testimony is not of an outcome. My testimony is in the Lord Jesus Christ. And I think that's a beautiful, and this, uh, if I can quote Elder Christofferson, um, God is not a cosmic vending machine. If you put all of your eggs into the basket of, well, if I'm obedient and I follow the commandments, then my life will be good. You're going to be disappointed. Um, this that's this is so important. I, again, following up on on this idea of the quality of gospel teaching. Yeah. If our wards are, you know, pressure cookers of outcomes based gospel teaching, you know, if you if you keep the commandments, then such and such things will happen in your life, and such and such things won't, and these will be your outcomes. You know, if that's the quality of your gospel teaching in your ward, then you're going to have people whose life experiences don't reflect those cause and effect statements yep. and belonging is going to decrease. So again, the dance steps of the community are, are this, you teach Christ, you talk of Christ, you love instead of making pronouncements about outcomes and, and things like that. I think you nailed it. I think that's exactly right. Um, so don't downplay. This was one that, that was emphasized repeatedly. Um, don't talk like we're not in the room because we are. Um, it's really offensive. Like don't, don't kind of make a joke and then say, oh, I guess I shouldn't have said that. <laughs> right. Um, one of the ones that, that people will do is a defense mechanism. And I am guilty of this, not on this issue, but just as a general rule, when something's uncomfortable, I like to crack jokes right? Like, I just think it's a, it's a defense mechanism and it's, it's a way to get out of an awkward conversation. Um, I think that it's actually a lot better to say, Hey, this is, this is tricky. Can I think about this for a minute? I don't want to get it wrong. It's important to me. Um, one of the things that they said is don't compare it to stuff, um, particularly like alcoholism or like, uh, disability and, and stuff like that. It, it's, it can be uncomfortable. The next part is effort is more important than perfectionism. So I loved what one of my students said. They said, listen, we can tell when people are trying, right? So this is an LGBTQ student. And they just said, you know, I'm not actually that worried when people make mistakes. Like my first instinct is not to rush to Twitter and put everybody on blast and make them look really stupid. My first instinct is to try and, 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 and give them grace and to look out for them. And I think that's a better way to think. Now, we're just in a world right now where sometimes we're going to be on Twitter, right? I, I shouldn't say we. Some professor somewhere is on Twitter every day right? They're going to be on blast for some dumb thing that they said. It may not even have been something dumb. That's just part of the world now. And it's unfortunate. I wish we weren't there, but we are. And so get used to that, get comfortable with it and don't live your life in fear of it all the time. Because as it turns out, people survive being in a Twitter mob for a while and they're just fine. And at the end of the day, your obligations to be Christ-like transcend that anyway. 
So if you're going to be on Twitter, be on Twitter for, for doing the right thing and doing the best you can and trying your hardest and then don't worry about it, right? <clears throat> Next, be kind but demanding. So uh, a gay student told me this. They said, as soon as people find out that I'm gay, they lower all expectations for me academically. Now that is damning, right? But it's, I, I totally get it, right? Like, oh, I want to look out for you. I want to be kind to you. I want to help you. And all of a sudden, everything starts to go down, down, down. And, and again, it's it's one of the things I'm hitting on in the masculinity um, project that I'm working on. <clears throat> For some reason, we have the idea that that high expectations are unkind. They are not what what Jesus would do. That's just not what I find, right? I, I think that's the opposite of true. I think that expectations are critical and important. And by the way, um, you know, when when I was in education, the, the phrase was always thrown around: the soft bigotry of low expectations. This is in. Um, Nickleby and uh, No Child Left Behind, where you don't expect things from a minority student or a black student um, because they're because they're not white. Um, and I think it's really, really important to be aware of this, um, and especially to be aware of gay students or or students who might feel like they don't belong. They want to be challenged too. Um, <clears throat> I love expect great things from us. Um, I actually like to tell my students actually that, like I, if you're LGBTQ, I we need you. And we need disciples who love Jesus, who are figuring that out and, and blazing a path. When we talk about pioneers and, and figuring this out, that's exactly what we need. And uh, I, I, I love this last line, care is great, condescension is not, right? It's okay if you care about us. It's okay if you say, hey, I'm really glad you're in my class, right? I hope you feel like you can always come to my office. It's not okay when it becomes syrupy sweet and over the top. And, oh, I, I didn't say, I didn't offend you, did I? Like, just just be a normal person, right? I think that that's valuable. Yeah, try, try not to make it awkward. Oh, you <clears throat> poor thing, you poor thing, you poor, right. I mean, right. oh my gosh, people. <laughs> and it's with good intent. And, and some of it is just out of awkwardness, right? They just don't know that they're doing something really uncomfortable. Right, right. But yeah. So, sometimes that empathetic response can lead to some really, some real awkwardness. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, and the, the, you just said something that, that strikes a chord. One of the things that I have had to learn is that there is a difference between the response that is empathetic and the response that is geared to make me look like I am an empathetic person. Right. If you sense any amount of virtue signaling, you got to hit pause and say, you know what? I might not be doing this for the right reason. And instead I've started trying to say the empathetic thing, even if it doesn't sound empathetic. And that, that, for example, one student said something to me and I think they were kind of expecting a little bit of validation. And I said, I think you're wrong. And that's hard, right? And it, it, like, it's, it's not comfortable, but it was real and that was better. And the syrupy sweetness is not a good path to follow. So, right. Um, last one, this is, this is hard. Um, one of the things that I did as an assistant principal is I trained on suicide prevention um, or, and I went to, uh, maybe I, I'm trying to think if I ever trained on it. I think I went, I went to probably a thousand trainings on it. Um, I know that I referenced it. And when, when people would ask, they would say, well, you know, what, what do you do if you think that a student is suicidal? Um, and my answer was the first thing that you do is you understand that you're not the therapist. The first thing that you understand is that you are not the doctor, um, that your role is really important, but it is not the role of the person with a white lab coat. Okay. So you should not go into a, a conversation with an LGBTQ student assuming that they're depressed or assuming that they're suicidal. That gets back into this idea of the narrative that we are telling. I have LGBTQ friends who are thriving, yes, at, in the church and yes, at BYU-Idaho. That doesn't mean everybody is. And I'm not trying to tell everybody's story, but you need to check your default assumptions and ask them about their individual experience and say, where are you? How are you dealing with this? How are you feeling? I think that that's an easy thing that we can do. Um, it is okay to know the signs. And if somebody is depressed or if they are suicidal, to ask them about it, to uh, refer them to the Dean of Students Office, to get connected with um, student support services. There are a lot of things that you can do. And there's a great training called QPR. <clears throat> QPR, I, I'm trying to remember what it stands for, but basically the, the purpose of it is you get trained so you know the emotional CPR. Your goal is not to keep is not to fix everything. Your goal is to keep them alive and and safe until a doctor can get to them. And I think that that's a really valuable way to look at this. I had a friend who told me that they were counseling a gay student for twelve hours in their office one day. Um, and they were just so worried about them. And they said, "What what would you have done?" And I said, "Well, I might have done the same thing that you did." And so I'm not judging you for having them in your office for twelve hours. But if a student is at that point, I'm going to get them help immediately. And I want you to understand that. 
Um, one of the things that I've, I've heard people say is, well, there's not enough mental health services and, and supports. And I don't know, right? I, maybe there's, 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 there's certainly an increased need right now. And I can understand that. I don't think that, um, I don't think that I have heard of a, even a single student who has been turned away when they are in that place. There are waiting lists for long-term appointments and that's, that's across the country. That's something that is a problem. We need more therapists generally. Um, but I also think that it's really important to understand if we tell that to students, they will get the impression, why do I even go to the counseling center? There's not going to be any help there. They have, a, they have a triage requirement where they make sure to see students at least the first time and get them stabilized and well before they let them go. And I think that that's an important message to share with folks. Now, getting, getting on insurance and, and, and having ongoing therapy. Yes, there, there's, a, there's a squeeze there and I'm, I'm, I'm well aware of that, um, but I, I worry that if we tell everybody, oh, there's not a, you know, we can't, we can't get people in to see therapists, that they won't try when they need one. Um, there's also community therapists, there's third parties, there's insurance, right? I think part of what's really hard right now is it's kind of become the university's job to solve a lot of these problems when it's like, but we're university, right? It's really hard. And I'm glad we have a counseling center and all of that. But um, anyway, this is, this is thorny stuff. Go ahead. Yeah, no, I, I, I agree though. There are and this is probably an entirely separate presentation. <laughs> like the university is a, is being asked to do things that are not a university's function. Right. You know, it, it's not a university's job to solve mental health problems and make people emotionally self-sustaining and bring them to personal wholeness, right? Em, on an emotional and mental health level. In, in, in a very real way. Well, let me, let me tell a story from, I interrupted you. You can finish My apologies. I'm rude. No, no. I, I, I and so it, it is good that these universities have resources, but uh, this is, this is part of the dance as well uh, of self-reliance is students do need to be taught that uh, to have appropriate expectations for these environments that they go into, counseling centers and, and places like that. Well, and part, so I remember I was at Johns Hopkins getting my master's and a guy in the class uh, did something really funny. So the, the conversation was about whether we should get doctors in schools. And there was this new push by Johns Hopkins. They've got a big medical industry out in Baltimore. And the idea was let's get doctors in schools so kids don't have to miss school. If they have a doctor's appointment, they can get it right then and there. How many of you agree with this? And every hand except two went up. And everybody knew I was going to be the contrarian, so nobody was surprised. But there's another kid, and uh, he raised his hand, and they said, "Well, why not, guy?" Um, and he he said, "Because I think that this is mission creep, and you're going to run into a day when schools are all things to all people, and they can't be schools. They are going to be restaurants. They are going to be uh, meal providers. They are going to be counseling services. They are going to be doctors. They are going to be um, emotional support centers and psychiatrists' office." And they're not going to be able to focus on all of the other stuff. And uh, honestly, I think that's where we are. I think that's where we are in colleges right now. I honest, and, and in all honesty, I, I wonder, as a thought experiment, let me put it that way. I'm not, I'm not actually saying that this is what we should do. But as a thought experiment, imagine if universities everywhere said, we're going to get rid of all of our counseling services. We're going to get rid of all of our um, therapists. We're going to take that chunk of the budget and directly subsidize any student who needs it. And they can use that money in the community, but we're going to allow the community to provide for that because it's not something that we're equipped to deal with. Right. I am not sure that that's the wrong path. I, I mean, I haven't thought it through and you know, how do you subsidize it the right way? Would there, would there be enough money? How do you determine how much money is the right? Like there, there are problems, but as a fundamental responsibility issue, I think it's actually quite important to grapple with this the right way. Yep. Um, and I would also argue, you know, school is more stressful than living at home. So if you have mental health stuff, I want you to come to college. I want you to be successful. We want to help you. We want to support you. But you also have, again, this is part of that taking responsibility issue. I need you to sit down and look very hard at whether you're in a place to succeed in college. And I, I think that's an okay conversation to have. Yep. So um, there was a, a, a report at BYU on race <clears throat> and inclusion. And one of the things that it said was that um, there were instances of both animus and ignorance. Um, one of the things that I had, had, uh, folks do is role play. Um, and what I said was, if you haven't role played, then you are going to freeze when this happens and that's okay. It's very normal. Um, I have frozen before too. And one of the things that I, I had somebody do is I said, um, 
I walked into a teacher's room and I said, do a crazy thing. Like a, like a, the craziest thing a student could do. Cause I just need to keep my composure and respond to it. I need to practice doing that. So I'm not caught off guard and I still get caught off guard. Sometimes it's not a big deal. Role-playing allows you to, um, know what's coming and at least be a little bit prepared. So when a student did something that was inappropriate and I couldn't think of a good punishment for, one of the things I learned in role play was, I don't know the right consequence, but I'm going to think one up and we're going to talk at the end of the day, which is way better than being angry and mad and being like, I can't believe you did that. You have recessed attention for the rest of your life. And now you got to sit with them at recess for the rest of their life. And it's not going to work. And they know that they pushed a button and it's just not good. It's actually better to stay calm and to look at the student and say, hey, you did something you shouldn't have done. Let's talk about it in a bit. So the reason I, I, I bring this up is I, I had a role play with, with uh, faculty where I said, I want you to imagine somebody uses a slur. Are you going to freeze? What are you going to do? What if they use the slur, but they do it in, this, in this, this very clever way where they say, well, some people say that this word isn't a bad word if certain people use it, but they use it out loud just so that they can be edgy. Now, how do you deal with it? What if you don't hear it, but they apparently used it in a small group? How are you going to deal with it then? thinking through as many of these as you can is really valuable. Now, the animus and ignorance piece is really important. Ignorance means you say something stupid and you don't know that it's stupid. I have a friend who, uh, when, when Black Lives Matter was, was very much in the news, um, just an innocent, good heart, not super informed, not very online, and just said, well, I think all lives matter. And I just went, oh, oh, you don't, you don't know the, the, the landmine you just stepped on. And she didn't, right? She had no idea uh, that it was, it was the one thing you don't say, right? But it was ignorant. It, it, it was very much, you know, this is a person who's just trying to say, I think everybody's important, right? It wasn't super well-informed and it was a problem. Um, and I'm not defending it, but it was an ignorant statement. Um, and there are lots of those. There's a difference between that and somebody I know who says, when somebody says Black Lives Matter, they get in your face and they say, well, I think all lives matter. Okay. You know that all lives matter. There's a difference between an ignorant statement and a statement of animus where somebody is angry and they have feelings against you. We have to correct both. As faculty, when you hear a statement, one of the easiest things you can do is say, hey, you just made that statement. I want to challenge you. Um, I think that that could probably be offensive to a lot of folks in here. Um, I'd like to talk with you about it in my office a little bit later. I don't want you to feel shut down, um, but I do want you to know that that comment is not okay. Um, and we can talk it out and, and we can go from there. If it's an animus statement and it's clear that it's animus, that's the kind of thing where I would correct publicly. Right? I'm not looking to socially shame, but if it happens in front of the group, in order for the group to feel safe, you've got to correct in front of the group and maintain that you control the group. And so if somebody said something really uncomfortable like that, I would say, that's not okay. I need you to leave today. You'll be welcome to come back once we've met and discussed with me and the department chair, potentially the dean. But what you said today is not acceptable. And there, you don't need to be angry. And they might even say, well, I'm not going to leave. Okay, then I will. Then class is dismissed and we will make up this class another day. Goodbye, everybody class is over. But you don't do you don't know how to reach for those tools, right? I, one of the things that I like to do with early teachers is say, okay, in an interview, um, what do you do if a student misbehaves? Well, I love them and I, I build a relationship. Okay, what if they still misbehave? Well, I love them more. Okay, what if they still misbehave? And it, what's funny is teachers want to pretend that if they just love them hard, you know, well enough and, 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 and get to know them really well and build a relationship that that'll solve all problems. Now it does solve a lot and it's a good, it's a good first thing to go to. So I'm glad that they say that, but it doesn't solve all problems. And to get ridiculous with them, I'll say, okay, now a student is dancing on the desk. What do you do? Well, I, I tell them to get down and I analyze the behavior for the function. And why are they doing this? Is it a need for, for attention? I said, okay, great. You're 20 minutes into your lesson and they're still dancing on the desk. Now, what do you do? And finally, they have to get to this point where they say, well, well I don't, I don't really know what I would do. I'll send them to the principal. Well, they don't go. What do you do? I don't know. Well, I do know because I've been through that, right? I, I, I've had a student who did something, not that specifically, they didn't dance on a desk, but they did something unsafe. And they said, I'm not going anywhere. You can't make me. And I said, okay, cool. You stay here. We're going to go out in the hallway and continue class. And when you're calm, we'll come back. And it's not something that it sounds easy for me now, but that's because I've been through it. And so role-playing is, is something that you can do where it's just like, talk more about this, have a, have a department meeting about, you know, there's one kid that we know who I'm, I, I'm, I'm giving this as an example. This isn't real. Let's imagine you have a kid who keeps saying, you know, mildly racist stuff. Well, then have a department meeting where you say, let's imagine that he says this, what should we respond with and get colleague feedback and, and talk about it as a group. And that doesn't mean you'll be perfect either, but run through it so that you have some sense. Okay. Yep. 
and again, that definitely applies to church situations as oh, well. Oh, 100%. 100%. It applies to Sunday school, elders Youth forum, classes. relief society, yeah. primary, everything. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, in fact, I had a student um, who, uh, sorry, I, I was I was teaching youth Sunday school and uh, we had a black student and uh, he, he had, uh, I mean, he had a fro and it was awesome. And another kid just said, you know, they, they were joking back and forth and he said, and, and, and the black student said, yeah, you weren't even paying attention. Your scriptures weren't even open. And the other kid looked at him and said, yeah, you and your fuzzy hair. And I went, whoa, 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 whoa. And so I immediately corrected him. I shut it down. I asked the student to step out for a minute. I called the mom later that day and I just said, hey, this was super uncomfortable. I just wanted you to know that it happened. And she immediately, I left a message for her. She immediately called me back and said, oh my goodness, thank you so much. I am so glad you called me. Just so you know, they're good friends. They make fun of each other all the time at school. It's not a big deal, but I feel so safe letting my kid go to church with you because I know that you will interrupt if something like that is said. Cool. Oh, love that. Um, oh, let me go back. Um, this is both a warning and an invitation. What do you do for a student who doesn't really want to be a BYU Idaho, but there's, but you, you call the bishop, um, a buddy of mine works in the honor code office, really good guy. And I just said, so, so do you get people who you think to yourself, man, they really shouldn't have come here. Not like worthiness wise, but fit wise. Right. And he said, oh yeah, I, I called up a bishop once and I said, why did you send them to BYU Idaho? They don't want to be here. They don't believe in any of this stuff. They don't like the rules. Why are they here? And the bishop said, you know, it was just the best place we could think of. Now, I want to emphasize to bishops, if anybody is listening, and I, I suspect they aren't, but because, you know, me and my three podcast listeners, um, I don't think it's fair to that student to send them to BYU-Idaho when they don't want to be here. I think it's very much like sending them to sacrament when they don't want to be here. You're not actually going to do them the good that you think. At the same time, I also want faculty to understand that your job is to be the answer to prayers of the parents of that student. We're hoping that a faculty will take them under their wing, show them some love, hope that they understand the good that can come from being at this university and, and give them a good experience. And you can't do that in every case, but you can try your darndest. And I think that that's how I view this is our job. Again, going back to noble myths, <clears throat> is it true that every student should be at the university? No. But if you start to think that way, it's really easy to fall into the trap of, well, that student just needs to try harder and that student really shouldn't be here. And that student, oh man, this is not the place for them. The way to think, the way to wire your brain is to say, every student should be here. And my job is to make them feel welcomed in any way that I can. And if you're in the honor code office, that might be different for you. If you're in the, in the admissions office, you might have a different take. That's okay. As faculty, I think one of the best things that ever happened to me was working in public schools where we have no choice of what students we get. We have to work with all of them. We find a way. And we welcome them as best we can. And sometimes they're not the right fit and it's hard, but we find a way because that's the way that we need to think as schools. So, okay, principle three, quiet dignity, instruments of the Lord's peace. Um, so this is, this is important to me um, because I think right now there's something that I like to call the civility paradox. Um, the civility paradox is where um, good people keep quiet because they're thinking and they're trying to be thoughtful and they don't want to say anything too quickly. But what ends up happening is that the the um, the more thoughtful people cede the ground to the stupid people and the angry people. And you see this more and more. I told people um, a little bit about, um, well, let me let me mention Elder Renland. Yet in uh, unity requires effort. It develops, let me move this out of the way. It develops when we cultivate the love of God in our hearts and we focus on our eternal destiny. We're united by our common primary identity as children of God and our commitment to the truths of the restored gospel. In turn, our love of God and our discipleship of Jesus Christ generate genuine concern for others. We value the kaleidoscope of others' characteristics, perspectives, and talents. If we are unable to place our discipleship to Jesus Christ above personal interests and viewpoints, we should re-examine our priorities and change. Okay. Yet in some instances, the spiritual stress test has shown tendencies toward contention and divisiveness. This suggests that we have work to do to change our hearts and to become unified as the Savior's true disciples. So here are a bunch of resources and links. I agree with most of them. I find all of them insightful. Let me put it that way. Um, that doesn't mean that I agree with every word of every one of these, but there are a lot of these that are just really helpful to, to understand and know. Hey, buddy. Give me just one minute. Um, these are taken broadly. These, this is more of an insight into how I think. But you've got Jonathan Haidt, you've got um, Blake Fisher uh, in, in Public Square, you've got 
um, Elder Gilbert and President Oaks. Um, I think one of the ones that really changed the way that I think is Scott Alexander Siskin and Slate Stars Codex talked about, I can tolerate anything but the out group. It talks about tribalism and how we see others. These are all valuable and probably worth going through. Um, I think one of my favorites is that Elder Holland talked about, are we not all beggars? It's kind of the white privilege talk in a gospel lens, and I love it. It's one of my favorite talks. Now, there's a whole second one over here. My point with this is one of the things that I've included here is that the Lord is asking us to speak up more. One of the ones that I love is this top one here, the Mormon ethic of civility. This is back 10, 20, 20, 10 15 years ago. Um, there's a line in this piece that changed my life. And I'm not kidding about that. And that is that civility presupposes engagement. Civility is a mode of engagement. In other words, the purpose of civility is to engage more. When I raise the, the word musket fire, immediately the same thing happens every time. People start to say, it's a bad word. It's mean. It's not okay. And other people say, it's fine. There's nothing wrong with it. He didn't mean. And all of a sudden, everybody is ignoring that an apostle was asking me to speak up more. I'm totally good with somebody saying, hey, I don't like that word. Great, fine, we can, we, we can be friends. I don't even want to get into the debate because I don't think it's useful. What I do want to say is that I believe that an apostle of Jesus Christ has asked me to speak up in defense of the things that I believe to be true. And that means doing it. And by the way, I think that that's a, that's a good thing, even if you disagree with me. Because as it turns out, this is an, this is an ask for the most thoughtful... Uh, uh, Arthur Brooks talks about how we need a, um, a coalition of the virtuous and we need them to, but, but there's a problem. The coalition of the virtuous is smart enough to slow walk things, to say, well, hold on. I need to be tentative. There's nuance here. This is hard. I might get it wrong. And that's the problem. So I'm not saying that you should jump in without thinking. I am saying that there is an obligation to stand up and speak the truth from time to time. By the way, I will also say, just to add to this, um, if you want people to have stronger testimonies, I think one of the best ex best things that has ever happened to me was um, writing something controversial and realizing that you're going to get flack for the things that don't even make sense for you to get flack over. Twitter is really dumb. And once you see that people are just going to attack you because they feel like attacking you, all of a sudden you're, you're a lot less scared of it because what matters is that you're doing the best that you know how. Right. And I feel good about that. So if you if you are worried about your testimony, go bear testimony of something that you know is true. Even if it, you know, I know my parents love me and that families are important. Great. Do that. People are going to attack you even over something like that. Hey, you know, I, I, I'm not sure about a lot of the church, but I'm really glad that my parents never touched alcohol because of the word of wisdom. Great. Do that more. See people challenge you. And all of a sudden it, it really does. It builds courage. And I think that's a really valuable thing. I'm not telling people that I want them to read more. I'm telling people that I want them to write more to be the thoughtful person that speaks up a little bit more often, that has a podcast that says stuff. And that's hard at a university because if you say something stupid, then the university looks bad. And I, I get that. But at the end of the day, like, I think we have obligations to do this. So anyway, that's that piece. Those are excellent resources. Elder Anderson said, peacemakers are not passive. They are persuasive in the Savior's way. Um, and I think that that's one that I hope echoes in everybody's mind for the next little while. Um <laughs> Um, the distraction principle. So this is what I talked about with musket fire. When he used the word musket fire, everybody immediately... So Nathaniel Givens told me this. Maybe I shouldn't no, say No, it, it was Elder Holland who used the word musket fire. No, was, it wasn't. It was... Oh, yeah, you're right. You're it right. It was Elder Oaks first, then Elder It was Elder him Oak. before. You're right. And, and before Elder Oaks, it was Elder Maxwell. So yes. Elder Maxwell says it. And then 20 years later, President Oaks says it, then Elder Oaks. <clears throat> Elder Holland then uses it. But and it's, all of a sudden, it's a huge problem. <laughs> right. And, I think, and, and, and again, I am on the side of I never once I was I was BYUI faculty and I'm listening to the talk and I go, got it. He wants us to stand up and defend the things that we believe to be true. Right. Never once did I have any intimation that it was anything other than that. If you disagree with me, that's OK. It's OK. We don't need to ha have that debate. My point is that once we have the debate. So Nathaniel Gibbons, I think one time said something that's really powerful. When there's a controversy, the first goal is to distract from the actual remarks of the person and to minimize it down to one controversial remark. So one of the things that, uh, that I think it was Nathaniel, if it wasn't, then I, I apologize to Nathaniel, but he's smart, so I'm gonna give him credit. Um, one of the best things that I find that I can do if something of mine becomes controversial is to say, hey, pause for a second. You're bringing up some valid points. Let me reiterate the case that I'm trying to make in whole. Let me go over and just, 
And if you have a problem with one of those points, that's okay. Maybe there's some common ground we can agree on in other areas, but I don't want my entire remarks to be characterized by one small part because I could be wrong on that part and that's okay. But let's go back to what he was saying. What was President Oak saying? What was Elder Holland saying? What was Elder Maxwell saying? That we have obligations to stand up and defend things that we believe to be true. And I think that's the rub. And I think that that is an ask that if I'm a B, if if you're a BYUF faculty, I would actually put that in the interview, if it were me. And I'm it's not, um, but I would say you know I, I want to know that you're going to stand up and defend the the doctrines that you believe to be true. And I think that that's really valuable. Well, and which doctrines do you believe to be true? <laughs> well, that that to me is a. Uh, how do I say this? Those are two. I think those go in tandem. But anyway. That, but I, but I think I think you nailed it. And I think it's unfortunate that we're having the conversation. Again, it, it, to me, it goes back to fit. I have nothing wrong with somebody who says, I'm not sure that BYU is the place for me. Totally respect that. Right. I get it. I have a problem. And by the way, I think long term, if you know that BYU is not the place for you and you still apply and you still take the job, I think that there's going to be discomfort. And that's not because God is cursing you, but it is it is it is kind of buying your own curse. Yep. And, uh, and that's the curse of the subversives, right? When, when you enter, and this gets into something I want to talk to you about later, when you enter an organization in order to try to change the organization, you will not be as happy. Right. Elder Bednar talks about this all the time. Um, almost every talk he gives about the university, he will ask students, are you here to be changed by the university or to change the university? That to me is the foundation of this fit question. It's not about worthiness. There are people who are here who don't feel like they belong, but are wonderful, worthy members of the church. And, and by the way, I think they're celestial kingdom inhabitants who don't like BYU or BYU Idaho. That's fine too. Right. Maybe you just really like your facial hair or you have long hair or whatever. Fine. It's great. It's not a big deal, but we're trying to do something different. And if it's not for you, that's okay. Don't, don't try to fit the square peg into the round hole. Say, Hey, maybe this isn't for me. I'll go to a state school. Great. Awesome. And you can right. still be a great member of the church. Okay. Um, my article, this is, you know about this, um, but this is about my article, which uh, which I enjoyed. Um, I wrote this article because I, I was writing my syllabus and I, I basically put a little line in here that said, I just want you to know that I want you to be here no matter who you are. And I thought, oh, that's just too vague. I want you to be here no matter who you are, but I'm specifically saying this to my LGBTQ students. Ah, that's too vague too. Also my black students. Also my, and now I have this problem of, I don't know how to say this. And then I thought, well, and if I say LGBTQ students, but I also want them to understand that I believe in the family proclamation, I don't want them to feel like I'm you know, pulling the rug out from under them. And all of a sudden, I, re I it was a paragraph and then two paragraphs. And finally, I just wrote the whole essay. And that's, I think, sometimes what you got to do. You got to sit down and say, you know what, let's, let's actually just write the full thing. And that's where it got published. These are my buddies. Um, these are my two friends who, who work at Public Square and help me publish it. And I think it went really well. Uh, I know not everybody liked it, and that's fine. They have that right. Um, but it pushed me to think better about, about this issue. And that's where a lot of this comes from. So I know you've read it. I'm not going to rehash it, but if people haven't, let me just really quickly um, mention this. This is from a presentation. A, a guy shared it with me. He, was, he said he was willing to let me use the slide. Um, you'll notice that there are LGBTQ dots on here. Um, and, and there's the red and there's the, there's the yellow. And these are the two political sides. And this to me is one of those life-changing slides. And he said, the problem that we face is that we're shifting from traditional beliefs to new beliefs. Now, that's not a bad thing, but one of the things that is a problem is that the people you hear from are the people in red, right? The extremists on both sides. The people you're not hearing from are the people in yellow. And as it turns out, the loudest voices are not the representative voices. And what you need to understand is that there are a great number of LGBTQ folks who are fine with the church, who are thriving in the church, who don't agree with the church and have left, but are still making, you know, are, are fine with their LDS friends. Um, there is a huge spectrum here. And again, this is this is one of those where I'm trying to break apart the false dichotomy and say, hey, there's, there's a lot of people and they have a lot of different views and all of those deserve um, attention. Uh, a friend of mine, maybe I shouldn't say this, but I will. Um, a friend of mine who is gay and a member of the church recently said, you know, it seems like people, you know, Twitter really values gay Mormons' perspectives unless they happen to be gay Mormon and also Orthodox. I don't think it would be appropriate for me to tokenize and to say, his is the real version of what's going on. You need to listen to him. He's the one. No, that's not true, but he is one of some. And his deserves to be valued, right? And by the way, there are a lot of people who have lots of different ranges of belief on this issue. And you need to, you need to step back. Now, I would also argue 
I, I am a little bit opposed. Uh, you know, we say, you know, I wanted to be friends with everybody. Well, I, I do, but I, I really, I really do have opponents, not enemies, maybe, but I do have opponents, but it's the red on both sides. The people in the middle, if you're willing to be thoughtful and kind, those are the the solution to this issue is that the yellows speak up more. The yellows say, hey, I have a feeling about this and I'm not going to get it right or perfect, but I'm going to try. Okay. So um, last, we're, we're wrapping up here, finally, after two and a half hours. You've been very patient. Um, a couple of things here to wrap up. Um, I think it's really important that we give people permission to author their own story. Um, so... I, I, I collected some quotes. I know someone who's happily married and it's working fine for them. Well, the LGBTQ people I know are suicidal and you shouldn't expect otherwise. Um, my response to that is don't shoehorn their story into your preferred narrative. And by the way, I say that to members of the church too. Sometimes, you know, I, I think part of the reason why mixed orientation marriages can be so damaging is because it becomes the default. If you're gay, we'll just get married. It'll be fine. And that's a very minimizing way to look at it. And it's not always the case. Um, and it can be really, it can go really south. I think a better way to say it is you've got lots of options. I don't know your path. I know God does. And I believe that he loves you. I will even go so far as to tell people that I believe he wants you in the church. But whatever you choose, I will support you and I will love you. That doesn't mean I'll necessarily agree with you. Um, and at the same time, I'm never going to rush right to the option that is best for me. On the other hand, there's also the other side, which is, uh, you're encouraging people to get married? No, I'm telling them that it's an option. And I know it's an option because I know a bunch of people who have done it and they're perfectly happy and they're thriving and they have a good life. But if that's not an option for you, that's fine. Again, don't shoehorn in either direction. Let the individual be the author of their story. Um, anyway, not, not particularly unique or new. Oh, this is, I have to just mention this real quick. Um, this is Blake Fisher's piece. Um, where he says, why is it that all in LGBTQ uh, SSA saints are so reluctant to speak up? And one of the things that he says is that people are getting quieter and quieter if they're SSA. Um, and he, he talks about a lot of reasons, you know, the story weaponization or becoming a poster person. He doesn't want to be the poster boy for, for gay members. But there's also an issue of being treated really poorly by progressives, Right. There's an issue that if you're if you're LDS and you are not fitting the traditional I'm rejecting the church and the doctrine mold that people aren't very happy with you. Yeah, there's would, definitely a penalty that you yeah. pay. And there comes a point where a lot of people just say, it's not worth the penalty being public about what I really think. Yeah. Right. And and by the way, I've been on Twitter. I can respect that. Oh yeah. I can understand why people make that choice. I totally get it. Um Sometimes you will feel like it's right to withdraw from the conversation. And I can defend that. Sometimes you will feel prompted that you need to speak up. And those are different for different people. Um, but I do want to emphasize that both are valuable. So if you haven't read it, I, I think Blake Fisher's piece is, is, is worth your time. Um, last, this is not one that I got into. We ran out of time. And like I said, this has been a very different presentation than the one I gave at BYU-Idaho. Um, but I do just want to mention in passing that there are a couple of things that we do that are not very fair, I think, to our LGBTQ friends. And one of them is that we preach a, a narrative of weakness. Um, a dear, somebody who's dear to me, uh, I asked them about their experience. They said, you know, I'm, I'm really concerned that the ally, the LGBTQ advocacy movement, not LGBTQ people, in fact, it's more allies than it is anyone else, tends to default into a mode of they are fragile, they are weak, you need to be extra cautious. You need to be extra careful. You need to be uh, extra kind in a way that is not true. And it really rubs off on people. And, and all of a sudden, you know, um, we, we joke about the word triggering, but when you've been told that if somebody disagrees with you, it needs to be a profound emotional, you know, event, that's what it becomes. And I don't think that's good for them. And I don't think that's good for the conversation. I don't think it's good for anybody. Um, you know, when my Catholic friend said, so you do realize that you're going to hell, I was like, well, no, I, I don't. I don't think I am, but I'm good with you thinking that. I don't think that's how God thinks. But it, it, there was no emotion there. There was no frustration. I didn't, he wasn't trying to be mean. He, he was looking out for my soul. It, and to be honest, if it did bother me, I would have said, hey, that really bothers me. It's offensive. Can I, can I talk to you about it? Um, but I don't think it is good to preach a gospel of fragility. And I, and by the way, I think my LGBTQ friends who have talked to me have said the same thing, right? By the way, that doesn't mean that some people aren't really fragile. I'm, I'm not saying that. Um, so I, I think it's really important to, to just end on that note um, and just to be aware of it. I, I'm trying to think of a way to write this in an article that is 
thoughtful and sensitive enough without minimizing what people are really going through. And it's hard. Um, so again, if people drag me on Twitter, then so be it. But my goal here is not to is not to pretend that it isn't hard or to minimize. But my goal is to say that fortitude is is a good thing, um, and and is, is it is it is valuable for everybody. Um, I think there were a couple of slides, but um, this is just a review of my. Um, that's a review of some of my other stuff, and um, yeah, I think that's that's my my presentation. This has been an episode of Latter Day Presentations. We would like to remind viewers that our channel represents our own views and not necessarily any official positions of The Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. We hope this presentation has been informative. Our notes for this show are at Nauvoo Neighbor and the link can be found in the show description. Also in the show description, we have a link to provide feedback. If you would like to suggest a topic for discussion or if you would like to contribute a presentation on a topic of interest to you, let us know. Thanks again for joining us.